Members are welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the COVID-19 Response. Agenda Item 1 is the minutes of the previous meeting held on the 16th of April. Members are asked to note the minutes which I have agreed. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report and they are available on the Committee's web page. Members, before we begin today, this is the fifth meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. Since the last meeting, Mr Beggs and I have had a discussion with Mr Speaker, and I know that some concerns were also reflected by the whips at the Business Committee about making the most of this body. In the procedures, it's good for the computer pad. In the procedures determined by the Speaker and over the last few meetings, it's been made clear that there is, a more flex there is more flexibility at this committee than at a plenary session. We are keen to use that flexibility. However, the challenge from the Chair is that we're trying to deal today with two statements and ensure that every member is called, which is more difficult than normal committees, when we have over 20 members present and participating here today. Therefore, I would politely say to members at the outset that this committee was created as an additional and specific scrutiny mechanism of the executive's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This is particularly important when question time is suspended. I'm giving notice to members today, before they listen to the, mem the minister's statement, that what we need today are questions. Members will have other opportunities for making speeches. Members who ask short, sharp, focused questions will be offered the opportunity to ask a supplementary question. Members who engage in lengthy preambles may find that they will not be called to ask a supplementary question. So I am asking for cooperation from members today, and I will, of course, be expecting the Minister to give succinct answers as well. Agenda item two is a statement from Mr Robin Swan, the Minister for Health. The Speaker received notification on the 27th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to make is included in your pack at page 8. I'd like to welcome the Minister for Health to this meeting of the Committee, and I invite the Minister to make his statement, which should be heard by members without interruption. Minister. Um, and thank you, Chair. Um, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks. thank you for accepting my request to, to address you again today, and as the, the Chair has said, this is the second time I have addressed this committee out of the five sittings that it has had. Um, this virus is revealing many absolute heroes, and none more so than our health care workers and their families. But on this day, I think it's important that the Assembly also places on record its acknowledgement and best wishes to Captain Tom Moore, now Honorary Colonel Tom Moore, on his 100th birthday. His fundraising efforts have inspired a nation, yet only when this virus passes, and it will pass, will the sheer impact of his morale-boosting efforts be fully realised. In coming here today, I am keen to continue the open and transparent approach that my department and the wider health and social care sector is taking in response to the COVID-19 emergency, and welcome this opportunity to further update you today. We had our first death in Northern Ireland due to COVID-19 on the 19th of March, six weeks, 42 days ago today. Since then, we have seen 3,536 confirmed cases of the disease, and sadly today, I announce a further nine deaths. That brings the total to 347 souls that have been lost. That's 347 families that have lost loved ones, and 347 people that have left behind devastated family, friends and neighbours. And to be clear, that figure is not just hospital-related deaths. It includes a number of those who have sadly passed away at home and in residential and nursing homes and in our hospices. I said during the week that the death toll is already on a scale not seen during the worst of the troubles, and that wasn't rhetoric. I hope that, comp that comparison brings the scale 
of this home to everyone once again. Because I hope those flouting the restrictions or clamouring for them to be lifted will consider those figures and will be jolted back to reality. We all need to keep doing the right thing on social distancing, and the vast majority of people are continuing to do that. However, there is a risk that the important work done to save lives could lead to complacency in some quarters. The spread of the virus so far across the community has not been as serious as we first feared. But that doesn't mean the warnings were misplaced. It means the warnings were taken seriously and people stayed at home and kept their distance. As the Chief Scientific Advisor warned earlier this month, Northern Ireland remains on a knife edge. I will now take some time to explain the latest developments in the approach I have adopted to deal with this emergency and to outline some of the significant actions that have been key uh, to my response. Testing has always been a critical part of our pandemic response. It has been deployed for different purposes as this COVID-19 pandemic has evolved. It is a vital part of our weaponry and will continue to be so. I would like to reassure you that testing is growing and will continue to do so as rapidly as is possible. We are working with a number of key stakeholders and delivery partners across the HSC system, local universities and industry to further expand testing capacity across Northern Ireland. Our approach includes targeted testing of patients in particular health and care settings, testing in the community for surveillance purposes and testing of key workers to allow our essential services to keep running. At the start of this outbreak, HSC Laboratory Service had capacity of around 40 tests per day. The latest number of tests carried out that will be officially reported later today are 1,419 in our local labs and a further 824 as part of the national testing programme at the three local testing sites. That means yesterday we carried out or completed a total of 2,243 tests, our highest daily number to date. To date. And I would again pay tribute to all the staff working across our testing sites and laboratories. But while the increase in testing is positive, I still want to increase our capacity further. A consortium involving our universities, local businesses and AFPE has been established, and the purpose of that is to support and further scale up the expansion of diagnostic testing for COVID-19. To date, 22,328 individuals have been tested in our local labs. That figure includes over 7,000 healthcare workers. It has been a key priority of mine to ensure that any staff who were sick or who were staying at home due to a symptomatic family member were tested and tested quickly. In recent days, I have also announced the expansion of the testing initiatives. That included surveillance testing and general practices on hospitals, as well as significantly increased testing in care homes. This is an important, this is an important so I want to use this opportunity to explain in detail, as I did when I updated executive colleagues yesterday. The recent developments in testing include a programme of testing and surveillance and general practice, which started at the end of last week. This programme will involve testing and data collection for a sample of patients with respiratory symptoms pres presenting to their GP. These will be patients whose symptoms do not require referral to hospital or to a primary care COVID centre. The surveillance testing programme will be based on general practices already involved in the influenza GP potter sur spotter surveillance system. We will also include a rolling programme of testing and surveillance in emergency departments, which starts this week. This rolling programme will include testing a sample of patients who attend an ED with mild or moderate respiratory symptoms and who, following clinical assessment, are deemed not to require admission to hospital. It will also include testing of patients who are admitted to hospital for emergency or elective care. It will include testing of all residents and staff in any care home identified as having a potential outbreak or cluster of infection. We will also include testing of all patients being discharged from acute hospital care to care homes. It will include the testing of all patients and or residents being transferred into a care home from any setting, whether that be from hospital, supported living or directly from their own home. We will also include the UK-wide staff testing programme which has now been extended to cover key workers in other sectors, as well as those in health and social care. 
This testing is available at three drive-through locations in Northern Ireland, the SSE Arena Car Park, the City of Derry Rugby Club and Craig Alvin MOT Centre. And trusts are also continuing to provide testing for health and social care staff as part of their in-house testing provision. Chair, I have been clear about the challenges with PPE. My aim is to ensure we have a sufficient stock of PPE to allow our HSC staff to perform their roles as safely as possible. That is why I am committed to ensuring that we rigorously pursue every viable supply source, both locally and elsewhere. As I have advised previously, the Four Nations PPE plan was published on the 10th of April, and we are working closely with England, Scotland and Wales on all aspects of that plan. We have already supported each other by way of mutual aid, and that will continue in the weeks and months ahead. And we continue to explore new supply lines with the Republic of Ireland. We have also significantly increased supplies from local agents and local industry as to, commend, to be commended, as it continues to show itself, itself to be adaptable, innovative and responsible to this changing environment. China is the most significant source of worldwide supplies. The work led by my department and the Department of Finance to secure PPE is now at a very advanced and critical stage. We continue to work to ensure all possible steps are taken to open up a supply chain that meets our needs and supports our Four Nations approach. Additionally, clear specifications and photographs will be requested to ensure stock is compliant with our requirements. Chair, our nursing and residential care homes are at the forefront of the battle against COVID-19, and I want to pay tribute to the hard work and dedication of staff working across the care sector at this very challenging time. It is vital that we continue to support care homes and their staff to keep themselves and the vulnerable pe people they care for safe and well. Ensuring care homes have sufficient supplies of PPE is an absolute priority, and Trust will work with care homes in their areas to ensure that each home has a buffer of stock. I have also taken steps to ensure that homes can continue to operate at this difficult time. Health and Social Care Trusts will continue to work in partnership with care home providers to help deal with staff shortages. Where people have responded to our workforce appeal, those with the right skills will be prioritised for deployment within the independent care home providers. And trust staff have already been redeployed to care homes and will continue to be. On Monday of this week, I announced an additional £6.5 million for Northern Ireland care homes as part of a series of measures to support the sector during the COVID-19 pandemic. This additional funding will help ensure homes can increase the level of cleaning undertaken and bring in any additional staff they need to help support the isolation of residents when this is necessary. Under the support package, homes will receive a payment of £10,000, £15,000 or £20,000 depending on their size. But as we progress through the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to ensure that the public health response adapts to the evolving situation to ensure that it continues to be as effective as possible. Contact tracing of those who have been in contact with people who have COVID-19 is a key public health measure and will assist in tracking any future outbreaks of the virus and forming actions that are required to further suppress it. The aim of the contact tracing programme is to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and save lives by rapidly identifying and closing down chains of transmission to reduce population spread and protect those most vulnerable. The benefits to be realised include flattening the peak and reducing the impact on health service delivery capacity. It will also support wider social and economic recovery. During April, the Public Health Agency has been working intensively on in putting systems in place to recommence contact tracing for COVID-19. This is including the development of contact definitions, contact management algorithms, scripts, databases, training materials, facilities and software for Northern Ireland. Approximately 50 staff were identified for the initial rollout of contact tracing, which commenced on the 27th of April. This week, training will be delivered and the process and systems will be tested and refined. The contract tracing team is expected to expand to around 300 by week four. 
A number of agencies are being actively engaged to provide suitable staff to deliver contact tracing. These include the universities, medical and nursing students, councils and environmental health officers. The manual contact tracing process being piloted is using a new IT system not previously seen in Northern Ireland. The system supports capture and analysis of contact tracing information and is the same system used by the contact tracing teams in the Republic of Ireland. This logically will facilitate easier sharing of information about outbreaks in the border regions. However, there is still work to be done on what information would be systematically shared and under what legal and information governance framework. In addition, there is a new mobile smartphone app being built that allows members of the public to use their mobile phones to recognise proximity to other app users and inform each other on, on, anonymously when one of the users is confirmed as infected through a positive test result. This has been built as a UK-wide service where anyone in any of the four nations could potentially download and use the app. Chair, the modelling group meets regularly to review modelling assumptions in light of the latest emerging data. This is important as the modelling work is particularly sensitive to assumptions based on emerging data and thus is expected to change over time. The modelling group last met on the 21st of April 2020 and agreed that no change should be made to the current modelling. We now need to see if the number of infections will start to come down, thereby indicating that Northern Ireland is beyond the peak. We will know this is over that we will know this over the course of the next week or two. My department has been working closely with colleagues in HSC Trusts, the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency to put in place a range of measures in order to protect the health of the people of Northern Ireland in the context of the COVID-19 emergency. The response of COVID-19 and its impact is a rapidly changing picture. My department and the entire health and social care system are acutely aware of the issues emerging and are working to ensure that every conceivable, conceivable effort is being made to help people keep safe and protect staff. I have been clear that funding pressures will not be an obstacle in taking forward what needs to be done. It is generally expected that the Department will have sufficient additional funding requirements as we move through this pandemic and as this rapidly evolving and fluid situation unfolds. Expenditure forecast and associated funding requirements are uncertain, given the fluidity of the position and the need to base projections on high-level assumptions, including timeframes. It is likely that the volatility of estimates will continue in this context for at least the next three months. Chair, in regard to the review of regulations and exit planning, on next steps, I very much wish that I could provide some certainty on what the future holds for us all. While there are grounds for hope that the outbreak can be brought under control through maintenance of the current restrictions, coupled with the continuation of the high level of compliance that has been observed by the people in Northern Ireland, the outbreak has not yet reached the point where the restrictions can be relaxed. There will be no major or sudden shifts back to how things used to be. It must be stressed that any future decisions on social distancing regulations will be taken carefully and incrementally. The progress achieved through good adherence to the restrictions by the people of Northern Ireland will be lost very quickly if there is any adverse change in compliance with the existing social distancing measures or relaxation of the restrictions that help achieve that compliance. The time will come for a discussion on what comes next, and we have to face this together, honestly and openly. There will not be any easy decisions, because we recognise that simply maintaining the current lockdown indefinitely could have serious repercussions for many people's mental and physical well-being. We will all have to weigh up our options very carefully working closely with colleagues across these islands to ensure that we take the right decisions at the right time. In conclusion, Chair, I would add that this crisis has brought home some really important realities to all of us. It is underlined more than anything else I can ever remember 
just how essential the health service is to this society. And recent weeks have shown the importance of having sufficient capacity built in, both to ensure the quality of day-to-day -day service provision and also to prepare for the pandemics and other shocks that can't readily be predicted. That includes being more self-sufficient in future for vital supplies of PPE and other goods, relying on the globalised market, with its just-in-time supply chain, which has risks attached in times like this. At this point, I want to thank the local companies who have stepped up to the plate and started supplying protective equipment to health workers. They are local heroes too. Despite the current challenges, our health service is looking after us all and keeping us safe. So we need to look after it better. By that, I'm referring in particular to the last 10 years of financial squeeze. We can't keep running a health and social care system on empty in the future, barely getting by, living hand to mouth on single year budgets and failing to make the necessary transformational changes to ensure we properly meet the needs of the population. Let us resolve to do better for the health service that has stood so firmly by us, to fund it properly long term and transform it for the better. Let that be one of the lasting legacies of this period we are living through. Let that be the true lasting tribute to those we applaud every Thursday night. Nowhere is this commitment more necessary than in social care. We see that so starkly as our care homes struggle with the COVID-19 onslaught. The importance of social care is clearer today than it ever has been. So too are the financial challenges that have been building for years in that sector. We have to make sure it's in a much better place in the future. That means taking a long, hard look at the current model of care to ensure it better meets the needs of the population it serves. One key aspect of that will be seeking to move from a transactional-based approach to funding to an outcome-based approach. I want to acknowledge the heroic work being done by many private sector care providers at this time, and I want to put that on record and say thank you. But it's been very clear in this crisis that the independent sector has needed the state to step in to support it, not least with PPE supplies and staffing. For the future, we need to ensure that we continue to build a true partnership rather than a commercial relationship. Let's build on that principle as we plan for the future and look to a better life after COVID-19. Chair, that concludes my statement today. I thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, before we proceed to questions, for which I'll allow about an hour, I want to again reiterate my earlier point. We need to have short, sharp, focused questions. There are 20 people listed as wanting to ask a question. So if the questions are kept short and sharp, and the answers too, we will be able to get through, and everyone uh, will be able to ask their questions. And the first person on my list is the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr. Colin Gildernew. Gordon Mayogut, Prior Last Kian and I want to thank the Minister for coming today and for the statement that he has given uh, to the Chamber. I also want to share his condolences with those 347 families uh, that have been bereaved as a result of this. Um, I also share your concern in relation to the, the situation with social distancing and traffic. I have noticed a significant increase today as opposed to last week, and I think I just would, would appeal with you, with people, to say only go out for essential journeys. We are not out of the woods here, and I think it's important to recognise that. If anything, we may have arrived at, at a, a clearing where we can see and we can look back on the path that we were on or may have been on, and we can use that to advise how we move forward. So we know that the Chief Medical Officer, Michael McBride, is classified as an observer at the SAGE uh, meetings and can only submit questions in writing. So I'm wondering, have you raised the issue of the unequal status of our Chief Medical Officer and indeed that of all the other administrations, given the unique circumstances that we certainly face here and probably each of the other, each of the other areas? So we have, we have a very obvious need to tailor 
plans here to our unique circumstances. So can you outline what issues the CMO has raised in his written questions to SAGE and provide us with the, with the questions asked to that group? Um, you know, can I start um, by once again thanking the Chair and the members of the Health Committee for their continued resolve in getting the message out that we need to, and, you know, in regards to the social distancing and people staying at home. Uh, in regards to providing you here now with the written questions that the Chief Medical Officer has supplied to SAGE, I don't have them with me, Chair. Um, if, if maybe if you'd have given me a bit of warning, that's where you wanted to go. You know, I, 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 could, I, could, have, I could have done, done that piece of work uh, in preparation, but it wasn't even part of my statement. But in regards to, to raising questions at, at, at the Scientific Advisory Group, we were able to do that. The Executive was able to do that. The First and Deputy First Minister sat in at uh, briefings from COBRA where we get feedback from, from SAGE. So that advice was coming back. So look, I, I, can, I, I can certainly get you the written questions and I'll provide that through the normal means through the committee if that's, that suits. Mr. Gildon, you for a supplementary? Um, well, I suppose my, my, my additional question will be around the fact that the surge planning has, has thankfully not uh, been as bad as was expected. That has created potentially some capacity within the hospital settings at the minute. Is it possible that that could be utilised in order to delay discharge of patients with COVID-19 or suspect cases where a test hasn't come back to delay discharges to provide additional support to that vulnerable sector? Yeah. yeah. No, the, 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 chair, the, the chair again makes a valid point and it's something that trusts are already doing. And I think when we brought in the change and in, then in, in the, the testing capacity was at the, the request of, of care homes so that we were testing 48 hours before discharge so they knew the status of a client or a resident actually coming in those homes should they be discharged from, from hospital. But in, in regards to the capacity uh, that was created by the surge plan, our surge plan took, took effect and over a very short space of time while we prepared the health service to come prepare itself and to be able to cope with what we were expecting to be the, the, the worst case scenario of the number of people with COVID-19. That thankfully hasn't happened at this moment in time. So where we are across the Health and Social Care Board, across the, our, our various trusts in, uh, within the department, is like actually about how we re-engage some of those services so we start to come back down from our surge capacity and utilise some of the capacity within our hospitals as well. But in regards to supporting COVID patients within the hospital, that's what we are doing because we have a number of patients who are currently hospitalised rather than being returned either to a care home facility or an independent care home. So we do you know that assessment is made and I can give, give the chair the reassurance that that's done, that people aren't simply being discharged back into a care home facility without that assessment being done in regards to medical need. I call Mrs Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to the House today and, and for all the detail that is included. I just want to put on record uh, my two thoughts of those 347 families who are bereaved and uh, going through a terrible time of grief today. Um, in terms of a question, could I ask the Minister if he's confident that his department um, are accurately reporting the deaths? Uh, related to COVID-19 um, and to that that, that, that total um, death toll does include all non-hospital um, deaths as well. And I thank the Vice Chair for, for, for her statement. And I, what we have been doing in the Public Health Agency announcements that have been made, made uh, available are those deaths that have COVID-19 recorded um, as the cause of death and have been tested and have received a positive test in the last 28 days. So any death that is COVID related or the GP has think it is or it has appeared anywhere on the death certificate is picked up eventually and in the NISRA piece of work. Because what we have to remember, NISRA is the body who officially record death statistics in Northern Ireland. What we have been doing through PHA and through the department and daily updates is basically a surveillance report so we can get an indication of the number of lives being lost for those people who have tested post positive for COVID-19 in the past 28 days, and that's now irrespective of location. Mrs Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank uh, the Minister for that clarity. And on, just on the back of that as, as a supplementary, uh, I'd like to ask the Minister if, um, if you are satisfied that you have received adequate numbers of trust staff with the appropriate skills within the workforce appeal um, to ensure that care home uh, support 
is at a safe level. And thanks, and it, it has been, you know, it is an, it is an issue that we're, we're live at at the minute because what we've actually asked is for volunteers to come back and volunteers within the health and social care system to come up and support our care homes. Uh, we may come to a stage where some of those care homes actually require direct intervention and we do actually put staff in uh, by direction. Uh, I think we have one trust may have already had to take those actions in regards to to a specific care home or a number of care homes in its locality, so that we're actually rather than just supplementing the, the independent and private sector, we're actually going in and being more hands-on, more more proactive, and actually taking a, a leadership role within some of those homes as well to make sure that provision and support is there. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the statement and his work to date. And on behalf of the SDLP, I offer our thoughts, prayers and condolences to the families of the 347 individuals that have lost their lives. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, it, it was of course proper and right that there was a reconfiguration uh, and clearance uh, of services for the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but given that, thankfully, due to people's diligence and sticking to the rules, um, it looks like the numbers that don't need hospitalisation to the level that was anticipated, has some plan or some consideration um, been given, and I think you made some reference to it there, about additional services that have been cancelled, um, but which are of critical importance to people, such as cancer screening uh, and coronary care diagnostic work, so that we're not building up for ourselves a, pand a pandemic of a different type later in the year? The member makes a, makes a very valid point, but when we were going into the surge planning and we were, when we were stepping back services, it was done, I suppose, on a risk-based approach because what we couldn't afford to do, you know, and at that point in time, if the member recalls, we were looking at those horrific scenes in Northern Italy where they hadn't been able to prepare their health service for the large surge of numbers and people that were going to be presenting. So when we did that, and we did it deliberately and did that, that surge planning and preparation, it was done on a measured and risk-based assessed approach on, on the service that we, that we actually stepped back in regards to elective care and some screening programmes. So what we're looking at now, and it's a piece of work that has been ongoing for the last number of weeks across the Health and Social Care Board and our trusts about how we re-engage some of those services that won't be... It's not gone back to the way it was, and I'll, I'll make that clear to the member. I'll not, it's not gone back to exactly what it looked like eight weeks ago. It will be making sure that we can use capacity strategically and in those areas where we've had to step back service that we can actually start scaling those back up again. Because he's right, we don't want to build up problems for us in the future if we can use it now. But what I would say to the member, and, and don't look at the perception of empty beds as simply being capacity. Because with those empty beds comes additional staff, comes the nurses, comes the ancillary workers, comes the cleaners, come the doctors, who are all working somewhere else in our health and social care sector, should be in, you know, in the ICU units and now supporting our care homes as well. So it's not just about the bed, it's also about the person who makes that bed work 24 hours, seven days a week as well. So, so it's the work that is ongoing, we're conscious of it, and that's why we deliberately made the appeal a couple of weeks ago, if people did need to present to an ED or to GPs, please do so because you know, we, we don't want people suffering at home when they actually should be looking for medical help. Mr McGrath, for a supplementary. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just make a particular case for those get waiting on their annual breast screening uh, reviews, because especially within cancer services, if people feel that they have um, gone past and they've been um, treated, they desperately need to know a year later that they are free of that disease, and that will certainly help them uh, in that situation. So just make that case uh, in that instance. The, the points members noted. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I would also like to add my party sympathy uh, to all those uh, families who have lost uh, loved ones and also to those who remain seriously ill in hospital. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, the Minister and his team for the work to date uh, and the efforts to his efforts to provide transparency throughout this crisis, and I think his presence today uh, is further testimony of that. Um, my question is, uh, we, we talked in the report, he talks about the heroes that have been produced by this crisis and, and none more than our health care workers, and we all absolutely concur with that. Uh, could the minister tell me, what does the, the overall staff absence look like for health care workers at the moment? And how do these figures compare with the rest of GB? 
Um, I, I thank the member for his question, and I, I understand where he's going, but I think one thing we've never done, or I've never done, is try to set a scoreboard out on how well we're doing in, in comparison to, to something else. But look, there is one figure that, that stand, stick, sticks out in my head at this minute in time, and that's as of, of a report yesterday. We have 307 um, care workers here off with a COVID-19 positive positive response out of our trusts. So out of a, of a, of a staff of over, over 70,000, it's 0.4 is actually off with a positive COVID response. Um, uh, we have in the region of, I think it's coming in the region of 2,000 members uh, of our Health and Social Care Board trust staff who are self-isolating at this minute in time. Now, that may be because they're symptomatic, but more likely because they've actually received shielding letters as well. So uh, in, regards to, in regards to that, they are small numbers, but I don't want to get into scoreboards and comparisons with other areas because I don't I actually don't think that's helpful for us. And I think it's a testimony to the work that has been actually done within our trusts to make sure that their staff are well supported during the past number of weeks that we've been dealing with COVID-19. Sir, I think that that figure does demonstrate the commitment of our staff and the debt that we, we owe them. Uh, but in terms of uh, access to uh, prompt testing, can the Minister confirm that that is now available to everyone in the health service? Yeah, and, and again, as I referred to in, in the statement, I think today is actually our highest number of tests that we've been able to to complete and, and report as well across the, the different pillars, both within the health and social care system, but also with the, the national testing programme. And I can give them that commitment because one of the, the pieces of work that has been done across trusts um, from the very early outset is to make sure that their staff members had quick and prompt access to, to, to testing so they could get back to work. And it, I think it is a testimony to those groups who are working on the testing and also the national testing facilities that we've been able to expand that recently to front care workers, to post office workers as well, but also that we've been able now to start and support the care homes as well in regards to the staff, those who are in those, and also the residents who are in those as well, to give that reassurance and that bit of, of security that testing actually does provide. It's not the silver bullet by any means but there is a, a bit of comfort that does come from, from having a test. Thank you, Mr. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement today. I'd like to concur very much with the um, sympathies expressed today in the Chamber and thanks to our healthcare workers. Minister, given that we now have at least 67 care homes where there have been outbreaks of um, COVID-19, are you not concerned that someone will take a judicial review of your <coughs> failure to act in regard to not deciding to not test all residents and patients, or sorry, and staff, regardless of whether there's been an outbreak or not. Um, I, I thank the member, and I can give her an update. As, as I left the office today, the numbers at 70 care homes. Um, that's out of 425 care homes. So it's, it's again, it, it's we're still at. Uh, it's not an acceptable number, but it's not what we've seen. I think in the number of homes that have had COVID-19 or, or the similar homes across the rest of Europe. Uh, in regards to worrying about the judicial review, I can say to the members the, num the, the number of judicial reviews I have at the department in this minute in time on various aspects of how we've dealt with COVID-19 on all other aspects of the health service is not something that I am worried about at this minute in time. Because as health minister, I'm worried about saving lives. Those judicial reviews, those inquiries will come there will be a time, and it's a time that I'm not willing to be distracted on with this minute in time. Thank you. Um, Minister, I'm wondering, therefore, then, are you going to bring forward mobile testing facilities so that you can go out to those homes and be more rapid in terms of the response of the Health Protection Unit within the PHA? Um, in, in regards, we have people already going into homes to do testing because that's the only way we can get people in, in those facilities actually tested because it's impractical to bring them to, to a facility within the hospitals or actually to one of the drive-through facilities. So when we do need uh, to, to test people who are in care homes, we actually go to them because it's a service that it only suits them and the residents that they're in. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, thank the Minister for his statement and uh, for doing such a good job and keep that up. Could the Minister um, tell me GPs are now allowed to test 
patients who've maybe got respiratory conditions. Is there any room for that to be scoped out further for any other conditions uh, to help with increasing testing numbers? Um, and I thank the member for his question. The, the point he raises is in regards to our, our influenza spotting system, which is 36 GP facilities across Northern Ireland. Um, and, and that's something we do annually to see where, where flu, flu outbreaks actually are. So it's utilising them that they, they have the capacity, they have the knowledge how to do it. So that's why we specifically ask them and utilise them to, to step up this service for COVID-19 testing. Why we focused on the respiratory problems is because that's an indicator for COVID-19 or those with respiratory conditions may be actually additionally susceptible to COVID-19. So we're specifically targeting patients coming forward with those conditions. But we've also increased to anybody who's gone in for elective like, or emergency operations to get them tested before they go into hospitals as well, to make sure that once they've been through their surgeries or the procedures, that they're not that they're not um, coming in with COVID-19. So there's additional problems with their recovery process. Before I call Mr. Eason for his supplementary, could I just say as well, members, if you only have one question, it's not necessary. If you don't want to use a supplementary, that's that's fine as well. Mr. Alex Easton. Okay, um, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, just to follow up on that, in terms of um, uh, testing, could the Minister maybe give us details of how many staff have actually been tested? I know you've mentioned about how many you've actually contracted. I thank the member. I think it's actually referenced in, in the, the statement as well. I think out of trust staff within the region of 7,000 so far has been tested, so out of the 22,000. Um, altogether, it's roughly about one in three have been healthcare staff. Commissioner Ennis. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, I'll thank the Minister for her statement here today. But I'd like to ask the Minister, um, as childcare um, is, is falls directly under your um, departmental responsibility. Can the Minister tell us why, weeks after the shutdown of schools in many uh, childcare settings, uh, key workers seeking childcare provision, as well as childcare providers themselves um, seeking support, are finding it extremely difficult um, to register an interest or access the schemes? So is that people, apply Sorry, is it people applying or the providers? Both. Both. Uh, in, in, re in regards to the providers themselves, as a piece of work that ourselves uh, and education come forward to. I know it's something I think you've written to me as well. I'm not sure if you've got the response to it yet. If it's not, I'll forward, forward it up to you as to the exact application on where to go for the, for the providers. In regards to, the, to the, key the, the key workers who need childcare, that has been established and it should be working over the last two or three, two or three weeks because I know personally of a number of key workers who've been actually utilising that and had access to it. So again, if the member has specific cases that she needs me to look into, I'm more than happy to take it on. But in regards to the, the childcare providers, I know there is a joint statement coming out from myself and education within the next couple of days as to how that financial support and guidance will actually work. So I can follow that up with the member. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and again, I'm grateful to the Minister for his statement and all the work that he's done to date. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're exhausted, Minister. It's been a very trying time. Um, again, I also would like to express my condolences to those who have found themselves bereaved at this dreadful time and who aren't able to mourn in the way most of us have with, with our own losses. Minister, I'd like to draw your attention to the issue with, regarding community nurses and community care workers who, as you'll be aware, are having to enter people's homes and go from home to home. And I've been contacted by constituents who are somewhat concerned that whilst others engaged in activity with patients have access to scrubs that are freshly laundered for them and full gowns, care workers are merely provided with an apron, a mask and gloves. And they either have to, re they have to return to their own homes between shifts before heading out to do their nighttime calls. And they are concerned not only for their patient's safety, but also the safety of their own families. Um, have you considered or will you review uh, the PPE equipment provided to those people who are transferring from home to home uh, to give consideration to full gowns and so on to protect those people in order that risk is uh, minimised as they transfer from house to house, potentially carrying uh, infection? Yes, sir. And again, you know, I'm, I'm fully aware of, of the concerns the member raised. We did put out the, a very detailed piece of guidance in regards to PPE and what facility and, and what session it should be used in, and that was supported by you know, 
the chief medical officers, chief nursing officers across all four nations, and the Royal Colleges as well, including the Royal Colleges of Nurses and the Royal College of Surgeons. So that, that PPE that guidance is there, and it's done at that national level. But uh, one of the things that we did actually do as a department, and we approached was, and it's the point the member makes about those those individuals who have to return home, and there's that concern about returning home with what they've been wearing all day in regards to scrubs or clothes. And we actually made an approach through Solus to councils. Could they look to open up uh, sporting facilities, changing facilities, to allow those people to go home and actually shower, change before they went home? Now, I'm not sure of the, the uptake that, that was, was actually picked up by trusts or those providers, but I know I think Belfast Council did it, and my own council by the East Antrim was in contact with the local trust as well to see if that was something that they would actually take up on. But I think it's about looking at those imaginative partnership ways that can provide additional support um, to those people who are taking out and carrying out vital roles and vital pieces of work in our community at a very difficult time. It'll be brief. Um, my constituents, Minister, are very grateful that councils have indeed allowed them to avail of showering facilities and so on prior to their going home. But I suppose the issue remains that they take off a set of clothes and they put on a clean uniform and they're out again twice the next day and twice the next day, and they're seeking full gowns. Um, and I appreciate that, I suppose, there are protocols right across the UK, um, but I would be grateful if you'd maybe take a look at that and see if there are other things that could be done to provide them with full gowns or more coverage than an apron for their clothes. Thank you. And I, and I think the point, the, the gowns are very, a very specific piece of PPE that's used in a very specific uh, medical setting, so it's not just a general, general apron as well, but or, or, or apron that we talk about. So I'll, I'll look at exactly so we understand we're, we're using the, the right language as, as to what they want, but I'm happy to have that conversation with the member on, and the she has individuals as well who want to have the conversation. We're happy to pick those up. Call Ms Emma Sheeran. I thank the Minister for his statement and echo the, the comments from across the Chamber. There is broad um, cross-party support as well as a commitment in NDNA um, for the Graduate Entry Medical School in Derry. And now that is even more important with the, the context of the COVID-19 crisis. And I would uh, congratulate all the student uh, healthcare workers that have, that have went into the breach. Can the Minister give us a firm timeline for when his department will approve the North West Medical School? In the campus at McGee. Um, and I, I thank the member. I thank the member for a question. It, it's very slightly from the statement, but the, the, the point is well made. Look, it's a, it's a conversation that has actually been had at the executive level because, uh, whereas the number of medical students fall within the remit of, of my department, and that's where our business case lies, the actual physical building and the support then of the school, for want of a better word, actually cross cuts economy and finance and the rest of the executive as well. So it's something that our colleague, the finance minister, and I are, are talking about at this minute in time. So, so the business case, as per the number of students, falls within my remit, and we'll be, we should be finishing that, that business case very soon. But where those students go does not lie solely within my department. That's a wider, that's a wider executive discussion. I call Mr Matthew Tool. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his hard work. And I echo the comments of others um, in terms of uh, condolences. Um, Minister, in your statement, um, I welcome you. You've talked a little bit more in more detail about contact tracing. The statement says that there, you think there will be around 300 people working on contact tracing in the coming weeks. It would be helpful to know if you see that as the kind of long run, long term average we need in terms of contact tracing. I know Matt Hancock talked the other day about 18,000 UK wide. I don't know the equivalent number in the Republic, but it will be helpful to know as we go through the next stage of, um, of COVID-19, including some you know, moving towards a new normal, as we've talked about, how many people you think we will need for contact tracing here? Um, or, or we, we've taken on the, on the first cohort to try it, which is the pilot, to make sure that the algorithm, the script that we're actually using, because it has far, it far changed from what we did initially with the PHA in our first case a couple of months ago. So um, 300 is our estimate at the minute, but there is a potential, depending on where the virus is, how it's spread, and there, there's also a potential that could move up to 600 which is a considerable workforce, is a considerable number of people actually carrying out a very specific task. So our, our estimate at this, this minute in time in, in, in week four moving to about 300 and then it will be an allocation and I suppose a decision as to how many active cases we, we have. 
where we actually are in regards to, to lockdown, because if, if we're still as a society mostly locked down, there's not that many cases to trace. But as we start to come out of, of lockdown and ease various restrictions, that's where we need more contact tracers. But one of the things that the, the members need, need to be aware of, and, and again it's the discussion I had with executive colleagues as well, contact tracing just isn't about identifying who has the virus and who they spread it to. It's also about the advice you give them and then being able to back that up with the support. So if you contact somebody and I have it, we contact you, your contact traced, Matthew, and somebody says, right, you have to go into self-isolation. We as an executive, we as an assembly need to make sure that there's a support mechanism that then kicks in for you and your family and anybody who's around you for the next two weeks while you self-isolate. So it's more about just finding who has the virus as was also ensuring that support mechanism that we've utilised over the past number of weeks here in Northern Ireland is also there going forward as well. So it, it's a very big piece of work that will take an awful lot of commitment across all executive departments. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll be brief and thank you to the Minister for that update. And following on from his comments and what he what he's said in relation to contact tracing, his statement also says, um, uh, and I welcome it, that contact tracing will have to be done, particularly in border areas and a cross-border basis, and they're working on interoperability in terms of process and also software. But the statement says um, uh, there is work to be done on what information would be systematically shared and under what legal and information governance framework. That's really important. At the minute, the UK is still within an inf the information governance framework that um, is within the context of the EU. At the end of this year, we don't know what information governance framework will be in, we will probably still be contact tracing. People will still be moving from Dundalk to Newry and Bonkrana to Derry. Is there a risk that if we leave the transition period without a deal and there is legal uncertainty around our information governance framework, that that would throw contact tracing, particularly in border areas, into risk? I would say to them, during Project Yellowhammer in regards to what we were, the pieces of specific work we were doing in regards to health, was about sharing the health, health information uh, on this island. Uh, and that's why I'm very clear in that statement, there is still work to be done. We think there may be a legal basis where we can share that information. What detail, what level of information we share um, has still to be worked out because that, that, this, is, this is early day stuff. This is, this, is new to, this is new to this island. This is new to the UK. This is, this is new to Europe when we looked at how we actually start to do this level of of contact tracing. So when it comes to the legalities, who holds the information? Is it held in your phone? Is it held in a central database? That all has to be that all has to be finished out at this moment in time. So when it comes to the protocols and how we get the app and the contact tracing up and running, again our focus is let's get it up and running, then we'll work around the rest of it when we get to the end of the year and we see where we are in regards to how that wider piece in regards to Brexit is working. Call Mr Mike Nesbitt. I put on record my admiration uh, and thanks for the leadership the Minister is showing. Um, there is certainly authority and knowledge, but it's mixed with uh, a tone and a calmness, which I think is incredibly reassuring for our population, who are clearly scared and have been uh, for some weeks. Minister, you mentioned mental health, uh, and I would like perhaps to ask you if you would take this opportunity to expand on your decision to appoint a mental health champion and what you hope that person will achieve. Um, and again, I, I, thank, I thank the member for his, for his comments. Um, we both shared a, a, another post which gives you that training. <sighs> um, but, but in regards to, to the mental health champion, look, it, was a, it was an action that was already there within our mental health um, action plan. But as, as, I, as I see where this, where this virus has taken us, where this virus has taken society and the strains and the stresses um, that it's putting not just on society in general, but also the frontline workers within my health service, within our care homes, all the rest of it. When we came out of this pandemic, we were already in um, a serious place in regards to mental health in Northern Ireland. It was one of the main issues that I was working on before coronavirus ever appeared or showed his face here. And I think it will be in, we will be in a more challenging place. So the idea of, of a champion, and, and look, I, I make no, um, I, I'm not embarrassed to say it, it was, it was his idea that I stole and took credit for. Um, 
but it's one that I think we need within Northern Ireland, within the executive as well, rather than just another departmental official to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it. But like the other commissioners that we have across Northern Ireland, those critical friends, those people who can actually step up, step out and say, no, you're not doing this right. You're not doing enough. You have to be pushing further. You have to be pushing harder. So out of all the other actions that were in the Mental Health Action Plan, I think this is the one that we needed to lean on. So when our Mental Health Action Plan comes forward, when the strategy is published, that we already have somebody there who can be that critical friend and challenge us. Yeah, I, th I thank the Minister. I would just encourage him in terms of the application process, the appointment process, to use what we might describe as a light touch. And I say that because uh, having applied to become a Victims Commissioner, the period of time between the interview and my appointment was something like 18 months. Um, the member will know me as well. I don't have that sort of patience. Call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and again, can I thank the Minister for her statement today? And again, I, I want to extend my sympathy to those that have lost their lives and assure them of my thoughts and prayers. Can the Minister advise has his department engaged or anyone within his department engaged with any other organisations and any work around uh, looking to find a vaccine for the uh, uh, or a potential vaccine, vaccine for the virus that we have uh, in our midst? I, I, I think the member the, the work the work in regards to finding a vaccine is one that's gone on globally across um, many health professions, many departments, uh, and many um, chemical labs. And I think even Queen's has has received a bursary and support as well to look to look to the vaccine as well. But what we're also doing as well is uh, we're, we're part of the UK medical trials, which is already trial on drugs that are already there that can help alleviate the symptoms and the worst ravages of COVID-19. So, so we're part of that. Um, our chief medical officer actually chairs that programme across the United Kingdom so that Northern Ireland is fu fully part of any medical trial that's coming forward for a drug that is already established because that shortens the period of it actually being utilised and being able to, to be used by people so we're not starting from scratch of a, of a completely new, refocused, new created drug. Um, um, I welcome the fact uh, that you have plans in place to appoint the mental health champion as, as part of the, your plans to improve the overall service. I want to get the Minister detailed to, to me as have he has any plans uh, in terms of um, preparing for the anticipated surge in mental health services following uh, the, this COVID, the, the lockdown period due to COVID? And again, no, and as I, I said in, res, in response to Mr. Mr. Nesbitt, um, it is something that was a problem we were we it was a problem we were starting to tackle um, before COVID-19. It's a problem will not be going away. It's a problem that's getting worse. We, we, you, you know it from from your own experience, Mr. McAleer. You know you know it from our own communities. When we ask people to self-isolate, the stresses and the strains that it is putting on individuals and families will manifest itself in, in the future. So as I said, when it comes to the mental health strategy and action plan, one of the key aims I thought was actually getting this jump in in place so they can start to challenge us as to what we're doing, how we're preparing. But as, as for a workforce uh, within the National Health Service, they're already working now. They've had to work differently. We're doing a lot more, um, we're doing a lot more online telephone conversations um, counselling sessions rather than the face-to-face -face pieces because of, because of social distancing. Um, but where somebody still does need a face-to-face -face counselling session, we are still doing it. But what we're, what we're preparing for and working to is fully cognizant of, of the struggles and strains that people are under. And even, as I said earlier on, in regards to, to that pressure that's been put on our own staff at this minute in time, and that's when working with our trusts, working with our trade union colleagues, we were able to put through, forward a psychological uh, support mechanism for our frontline workers so that they can go somewhere to find that, that additional support because what they're working through at this moment in time is a very strenuous period. Uh, I thank the Minister for her, his uh, response. Uh, can I also can I suggest that uh, whenever 
In rural areas, there's very specific uh, issues to do with isolation, and I'm very familiar with that myself, being involved in my local COVID response operation. There are a lot of very isolated people living in rural communities. And can I suggest that whenever we'll be looking at the mental health champion and plans surrounding that, that you work very closely with, the, for example, charities such as Rural Support and indeed the wider rural community network to try and reach out to those very hard to reach uh, people in rural communities because their mental health issues are compounded by the fact that they are very isolated from the rest of the community and society. Thank you. No, it, uh, and again, the member begs a valid point, and I'm sure he remembers, you know, our time in the Agriculture Committee, I remember that I used to be a board member of Rural Support, so I know exactly the work that they do and the challenges they do face, the, the, the do face our, our rural population because they are they are more so an elderly population in, in this time. And I think one of the things that we've really seen um, is how society has stood together in rural societies and in urban societies as well. Should it be the GAA club? Should it be the Orange Lodges? Should it be whatever rural organisation is coming together to really support and look after their own? So I, I think one of the things coming out of this, um, this pandemic that we're going through, I think we're actually seeing a strengthening of our communities. Because those people, when we're asking them to, to self-isolate and shield, we're not asking them to go away from, from the communities that they live in. And we're actually seeing communities stepping up and supporting those who do need it. So in regards to, to the specific ask that the member, the member said, as a former board member of Rural Support, I'm, I'm fully aware of that piece of work that needs done. I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Health Minister has recognised the work of private sector care providers in Northern Ireland and challenged us to properly fund and partner with these organisations. His department is responsible for funding and partnering childcare providers. So can I ask the Minister for uh, his update on the implementation of the £12 million childcare assistance package he announced on the 9th of April? And, you know, and again, I thank the member. You know, I'll go back to... To, to the question I think Shani had asked, asked earlier on in regards to that. There is a statement coming out from myself and the Minister of Education because it is a co-funded, as a co-sponsored um, uh, programme and supported how we support those, those organisations and individuals as well, so that the detail of that should be announced very shortly. Mr Little for a supplementary. I, I look forward to the details of that announcement. The Irish Government has obviously been able to implement a package with 100% salary costs and 15% of total salary costs to cover other costs for childcare providers uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, in Northern Ireland, childcare providers continue to wait for any funding. I believe may have to apply for that funding and may only receive up to 80% of costs. So I would encourage the Health Minister to provide whatever help and assistance he can to our childcare sector. Minister. And as I said to the member, you know, that announcement will be made soon. I'll make sure as, as chair of the Education Committee he gets first sight of it or he, uh, he's fully briefed on it. Call Mr David Hilditch. The Principal Deputy Speaker, and as the meeting has gone on, I've been taking the questions off here on the sheet, so I haven't a lot more to ask. But uh, certainly a robust, honest statement outlining the stark realities of where we are today, Minister. There's, just a, there's an argument going on out there at the minute in relation to the presumption of the Irish Premiership Football League. Uh, most sports call a halt whenever government asks for the lockdown. Tomorrow's the 1st of May. They're talking about maybe four weeks' time. As Health Minister today, what would your advice be? And maybe, maybe you have your advice been sought from you, but what would your advice be at this stage, even looking at the end of May for such a resumption? Um, what, I, what I will say to the member, you know, as a Balamina supporter, I'm no rush back. <laughs> uh, but sorry, what, sorry, 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 Joe. Uh, uh, no, I think what, what I will say to the member, look, um, as, as health minister, I have, you know, I have to be careful and weighted in any suggestions that I make because, because the way we work through these regulations and the way we're working through them jointly as an executive, as when it comes to each three-week period, uh, there are discussions had of what measure could be lifted, what measure should be lifted, but that's always done with medical advice and guidance that comes through my, my, my department, through the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor as well. So, so conscious, of, I, I don't want to make any commitments or give any direction to travel in here and any specifics at, at this minute in time, but if it's something that he has raised with his party colleagues, I'm sure it's in the mix of things that that have been asked to be looked at for the next for the next phase of the how how we approach the regulations. 
Supplementary, Mr. Hildit. Your grand. Uh, Mr. Patchy. Three last concurrent speak as Lation Ara as up the righteous. Uh, thank, thank you, Minister, for your uh, statement. I'm wondering, could you outline what progress has been made in developing a joined-up approach to tackling coronavirus across the island in the light of the recent uh, MOU between North and South? And how is that going to uh, inform our approach to testing, tracing, and data collection uh, in, in the context of maybe easing of restrictions in the future? And again, uh, you know, I thank the member before coming into the chamber, but actually. Um, uh, I can't remember what the title is, a quad call, I think it's now called, Pat, which was our, our, ourselves, uh, First Minister, Deputy First Minister, myself, uh, Tonish, the Health Minister of the Republic of Ireland, and the Secretary of State as well. So we had one of those calls before we came in. And it's exactly what the, the member's asking about in regards to how we make sure that we're, we're in keeping with what we're doing on both sides of the border so that there isn't an adverse effect on somebody moving at a different time or somebody taking in respect of a different you know, a different outlook or a different approach. Um, the memorandum of understanding, uh, as I explained at that meeting, um, hasn't changed really any way that myself and Simon work or our two, two chief medical officers work together or even the public health authority on the IH, IHE, IHS and the Republic of Ireland work together. It was more a formalisation of putting that Latin writing because we've always had that good cross-border working relationship when it came to health. Uh, and again, myself, uh, Simon Harris and our two chief medical officers and their two permanent secretaries have another further call this evening to discuss uh, in regards to you know, contact tracing. As I said, you know, the specifics we'll have to look at when it comes to people crossing back and forth uh, across the border, technologies that they use that we could use and we've actually adopted as well. So it's about sharing that, that, I suppose, that common intelligence and best practice. And it's working well at this minute in time because it would work well in the past. And uh, just picking up on the issue of technology and the proposed uh, phone apps for, for tracing. Uh, and as you said yourself, I mean, there, there are a large number of people who cross back and forth uh, across the border for essential work and so on. And if restrictions are eased, that number will increase. Well, one of the difficulties we've, we've witnessed over the last number of years is that when ideas are being formulated in London or the south of England, very much were forgotten about. And it's essential that that you provide leadership in that context to take uh, cognizance of the unique situation that exists on this island. I wonder, will you give a commitment to do that? I, I, and I think the member make, make, makes a fair point because one of the things um, that has come out of this is, as I say, a good working relationship with Minister Harris and the Republic of Ireland, but also the other four health, the other three health ministers across the devolved, the devolved nations as well. And one of the things that we've um, Benefit it may not be the right word, uh, but because we're the conduit between both, we can pick up the best ideas from everybody. So we have a great working relationship, and that's why I say specifically in the statement as well when it comes to the app on the database that we're actually using on that IT technology. There's actually some of the scripts as well for the contact tracing. There's actually something we've been able to pick up from the Republic of Ireland because we've seen what they what they're doing and how they're able to do it. They actually utilise and I think they utilise the Irish Army for the most of their contact trace and they brought them in at a very early stage because they had that ready, I suppose, that ready workforce, that manpower that they could use at that availability. I call Mr Justin McNulty. Can I thank the Minister for his statement and for his answers thus far and can I also applaud you on your decision to appoint a mental health champion. Um, can I offer my condolences and share with the rest of the chamber in terms of the numbers of deaths so far, the people who are grieving, the many families who are grieving and who have not been able to mourn their loss in our, uni our unique and special Irish way. I want to put on record, Minister, my appreciation to the communities, GA clubs, the sporting organisations, the schools, our ladies in Uri, the Abbey, my old school in Uri as well, and the companies who together have combined, I'm sure, to produce almost a million pieces of uh, PPE to help protect our frontline workers. I especially am a proud to be a Lisle man today. A local popular Lisle clan, the Doherty's, through their company Regen Waste Management, have uh, generously, very generously contributed £60,000 worth of PPE to our, our health trust, our, our Southern Health Trust. Minister, I've been contacted today by a number of families who have. Um, people in their family with cystic fibrosis. 
I advise that the regional centre in Belfast City Hospital is closed and up to 300 patients have been affected and told to contact their local hospitals if they need assistance. Local hospitals are advising them to attend their, their ED. You will understand the concern of sufferers of cystic fibrosis in relation to the fear of uh, transmitting an infection or um, getting an infection by, by attending such facilities. Can the Minister review that decision in light of the fear experience being experienced by the cystic fibrosis people in the north and provide updates and guidance in terms of how they should move forward, how they should proceed? Yeah, no, and, you know, in the member's opening comments, you know, he paid, uh, paid tribute to all those, those community organisations that are doing so much and, and the, 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 the businesses as well who are supporting our health service. And again, as I said in my statement, you know, I thank them and applaud them for, for stepping up at this moment in time. In regards to the specific supports of, of cystic fibrosis and, and the Belfast facility, it was one of the, the central um, resources that was stepped down at, that, that, at the early point in time in the surge plan because we were cognizant of how susceptible or how particularly damaging COVID-19 could be if somebody with cystic fibrosis was to to actually co contact it, so it was one of the early decisions that was made. But as we, as I said, uh, I think earlier on, as we re-engage services, you know, those key people, th those people within the community who do need that specialised health support and guidance will be getting it. I'll, I'll go back and again, and I'll check on the specific guidance that has been issued to people uh, suffering from cystic fibrosis and their families at this moment in time, just to make sure it is up to date and appropriate for where we are. And where we are looking at, uh, I suppose, re-engaging some of our services, where that can actually slot in and fit in. But I'll do that, and I'll get back to the member with that. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. In relation to the technological apps that are being developed for contact tracing, um, is it going to be the modern-day equivalent of uh, a medieval practice where lepers hung a sign around their neck to say that they've got the disease, will that application, how, how will that operate in practice in terms of somebody who has actually contracted COVID-19, will it be a, a flagging system for locals, for, for nearby people to move away, how will that operate? Um, I, I don't think we're just moving into to, to those scenarios. The, the, the intention at this minute in time was, say, if the member got a positive uh, test result uh, in the past two days, what would happen was that app on his phone would have carried where he had been over the past two days. It would link into all the phones that were close to him within the past two days, and it would send an, anon an anonymous message to say, last Thursday, you were in Craig Avon Hospital. You were walking through you know, at the ED at two o'clock. There has now been a positive case has been located in that area. Please consider getting tested or self-isolating. So it's not, it's not an alarm system will appear in your phone. It's not something that will forever tag you as being, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't like the analogy the member used, you know, and that, that sort of that labour approach, because it's not. It's about encouraging somebody to go and seek the appropriate medical advice and guidance so we can make sure we can actually contain the spread of COVID-19. But we won't solely be doing it through the app as well, and that's why the contact tracing uh, in regards to, to the queries that were asked earlier on. That's why we still have that physical presence of people who will phone individuals and make sure that contact is there. Because not everybody will either have the phone, have the app, or have an inclination to have an app like that on their phone at any point in time. So we'll be using old-fashioned telephone calls and contacting people, and also using the app as well. So it's, it's utilising what technology can do. Call Mr Pat Catney. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And I also uh, lend my support to you and the champion for mental health. Uh, I think that's great going forward. And also your kind words at the start for those who find themselves bereaved at this time. Uh, Minister, uh, provide, could you provide an urgent statement on the public highlighting the anticipated pressures that could exist in asserting each of the six essential items of PPE? Um, and will it be set out in public the standards of production required against each item in an effort to encourage more local businesses to consider temporary reproposing their resources? 
I thank the member. The, um, those specifications are already on online, Pat. They're through the CPD, the, the Central Procurement Directorate. It's one of the pieces of work that we were able to do very early on between health uh, and finance in regards to approaching our local businesses as actually who could step up and repurpose it. We've already seen, we've already seen just off the top of my head, the needles producing scrubs, block blinds, hookamagi producing face visors. Uh, we know very, very, very shortly we'll have a, a company in Northern Ireland now making gowns. Gowns been one of the more critical, hard to get pieces of of PPE um, across the world, actually. So to see those, you know, see our own industry stepping up and actually being able to manufacture, I think, is, is something that we should be immensely proud of. But it's also, as, I, as I've referred to earlier on, as well as in my statement, it puts that challenge back onto, I think, us as a health service, but also us, us as a society where we have been so reliant on that just-in-time international supply chain always being there. Because when we've seen in PPE in regards to China and our supply chain, we've seen that at the, the early days of this pandemic, it wasn't there when we thought it would simply be there to, to lift the phone and make that order. So, so the repurposing of our local industry is especially important. But all those specifications of those, those PPE items are online, are available. They're, they're not hidden, they're not secret. They're, they're open there for anybody who wants to try and make them for us. Minister, um, uh, what I was really trying to get at there was across all these islands, Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales, no matter where it is, that we try to outsource that and get as much of that made as we possibly can in order to help the supply lines. No, no. I, I can assure the members, one thing I made clear at the start in the three pillars of supply that we had was what we were getting nationally, what we were getting internationally, but also what we can make locally, because the more surety we have of a local supply line, should it be anywhere across these islands, the better it is for us. And it's about building up the stockpile that we've, we've used, not just what we're using currently, but the stockpile that we had in place for our pandemic stockpile that we, did have, we have had to use some of. It's about replacing that again, because if there's a second surge, a third surge, or maybe, maybe more, I don't want us as Northern Ireland or as in, uh, as in our health service being in that position again. Thomas Clare Bailey. Thanks, Chair. Um, and it's really encouraging to hear some of the overdue measures to address contact tracing, because um, as the Minister has already stressed, it's really clear that contact tracing will have such a huge, big part to play um, in forming any solution to exiting from the corona lockdown in combination with widely available testing, but evidence given by Matt Hancock to the Health Select Committee this week at Westminster suggests, um, as the Minister has noted, um, that they are running the contact tracing via national phone banks and an app. But of course, there are significant issues of privacy and civil threats to liberties around the use of such, such technology. So maybe can the Minister give us a wee bit more detail on who will own the IT systems and the apps, and who will have access to all data collected on these systems? Yeah. Yeah. And the member, I think the, the member makes that point, um, which, which is as well made, and it's something that, that I'm having a conversation, and the Justice Minister actually raised in the Executive when we started to have these conversations, and that's when, in response to an early member, it's who owns the data. Will the data be held in your phone? or will it be held, held centrally, because it has to be used for the right purpose. My intention would be that it was held as locally and as personally as possible. But I have to see the development of the app and where it comes from. The app isn't mine, to, the app isn't mine in development, so we're seeing how it works, but I want to make sure that it is fit for purpose and it's not used as some sort of big brother tool. Because one of the things, and I explained this when, when Matt Hancock brought the proposal to the meeting of the four health ministers, I made him as well aware that it's not just about who owns the data, it's also about the political sensitivities of such an app here in Northern Ireland as well. So, and then the Welsh and the Scottish pointed out they also had political sensitivities as well about who would own the data as well. But it, it, it is an issue that's been worked on. Again, we're, we're still looking at this app being probably two to three weeks away. So all those issues are being worked on um, ac across these nations. Ms Billy, for a supplementary. The, um and just further on to that, Westminster have also uh, announced that their, their five-point list um, that they want to see met before loosening any lockdown measures. Can we even here in Northern Ireland um, perhaps add this contact tracing and community shield mechanisms um, to that list? 
And, and, and what, what I will say to the member, that, that contact tracing and additional shielding, because I think that, as I said earlier on, that, that's the one point we need to be cognizant of, of contact tracing. There's no point of just sending somebody a message and saying, you've been in contact with somebody who's COVID-19. You have to be able to step in and support them and their family at that time. So while we haven't published a list, it's, it's the point that I've made to my executive colleagues. The, the support mechanisms that we have in regards to furloughing, food boxes, additional supply to, to benefits as well, will all have to continue in a different form or in the same form as we roll out contact tracing as well, because we have a responsibility, if we're telling somebody to isolate themselves or shield themselves from society to stop the spread of coronavirus, we have to make sure we're there to support them as well. Call Mr Jim Allister. I want to return to the theme of making up the lost ground for non-COVID patients within the health service. Um, understandable as the singular focus on COVID is, a knock-on effect has undoubtedly been for those who had procedures, screenings, testing cancelled, that there is now increased risk, particularly for cancer patients, of accelerated death. So I'd like the Minister to give more detail as to how he's going to make up the lost ground for those people, because at the end of this, cancer patients are still going to be cancer patients, and yet they have missed tests, they have missed treatments, they have missed screenings. We really do need to know how and when and with what expedition that ground is going to be made up. Minister? Um, and look, I, I can't give the, the member an exact timeline or date today, and I don't think he'd expect me, me, me to, because it's about the re-engagement plan we're, that we're looking at. And what that will, what that will mean, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be blunt with members, is that when we always expected you know, your closest hospital to be where your procedure would be, when we start to re-engage services, members will, or people who, who need treatment, who need operations, may have to and will have to travel. To central locations. As I, the conversation I had yesterday with the, the college, Royal College of Surgeons, when there was this, this perception um, that's out there that we'd have COVID hospitals and non COVID hospitals, what the Royal College of Surgeons was mean, were, were saying was there will be no such thing as a non COVID hospital because there's no way you can guarantee that. There may be COVID neutral facilities where we start to re engage our surgeries and our screening and, and those procedures as well. But what I will ask the member to reflect on as well, um, when I took over this post, we had the worst waiting lists across these islands. They've got worse. So the, the, the actions that we need to take will have to involve, they'll involve the independent sector, they'll involve um, running our hospitals to a capacity when we have the capacity to use. Because one of the things that, that we can't risk at the same time is re-engaging too many procedures, too many services, too quickly, so that if we do hit, get hit by an unforeseen second surge, that we're not able to cope with those people presenting with COVID-19. So I'll give the member the reassurances as the, as the piece of work that is ongoing centrally within my department as well, it does in, in, regard, in regards to re-establishing those services, but it has to be where we do it as well as when we do it as well, because we have to be, we, we will have to be, there, there, there can be no sacred cows, I think, when we re-engage some of the services where we look at where we actually do it and how we actually do it. Mr Allister, for supplementary. Uh, on a different theme, uh, what advice does the Minister have on the issue of the general public when out here about wearing masks? Is that desirable? Is that suggested? Or is that something that is dismissed because certainly I've had a number of constituents asking me should they or shouldn't they so I'd like to hear from the health minister should they or shouldn't they minister? Um, and I, I thank the member and I know it was, was recently raised by by the Scottish first minister at this current time we're weighing up the scientific advice as to the benefit it will could bring or will bring one of the concerns that I do have in regards to wearing cloth face masks um, is actually that it may lead to a perception that by simply wearing a cloth face mask that some of the other precautions, the social distancing, the good hand hygiene are no longer necessary or those actions start to actually become less of a priority so that the wearing a cloth face mask gives somebody 
a sense of immunity that it actually doesn't entail. So, so the wearing of, of the cloth face mask, we're still waiting on that, that scientific advice coming back. But what I would say to members is, um, why, why wearing cloth face masks, um, I, we're looking at the scientific advice. What I would also plead and also ask people if they do think that, that wearing a face mask is of benefit to them, don't look to the medical supplies. Don't look to the supplies that are already being utilised by our healthcare workers, by our domiciliary care workers, to simply wear when you're out and about doing your shopping or, or going to on, on your daily walk. Make sure that that medical grade PPE is there for the people who actually need it and actually who utilise it in the right space at the right time. I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thanks, Chair. Thanks to the Minister for his statement. I hope the Minister would agree with me that any consideration of lifting the lockdown before contact tracing and other World Health Organisation measures are in place would be very worrying and deeply dangerous. Does the Minister think that it was a mistake to not start contact tracing as soon as we started to treat people for COVID-19? Um, I, I suppose, going back to when we had our first cases, PHA was, was doing a piece of contact tracing. When we moved into a place where we asked everybody to lock down, there was no longer, a, I suppose, a wider benefit for the contact tracing. So where we're going now in regards to the pilot, we've started moving up to 300 people in regards to the next four weeks, is exactly to be able to support individuals and society as they come out of lockdown, so that when we see, um, when we do get positive cases, that we can contact, trace them, track them, and ask them to isolate very quickly so we can actually shut down on the spread of COVID-19 within, within society in Northern Ireland. Mr Carroll, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the Minister for his, an uh, his answer. He will be aware of people who are very concerned about uh, being told they have to go back into work, especially in non-essential businesses at this time. Uh, does the Minister believe that we need to recruit rapidly health and safety inspectors to ensure that when people are uh, going back to work uh, en masse, hopefully not any time soon, that we have enough people to ensure that our workplaces are safe for uh, workers to be in them? I am fully aware my, you know, my, my colleague, the, the Minister of the Economy, set up a workplace forum to deal with, with specific queries like that and what, what workplaces were essential, what work. So I, I know she's issued guidance as to what was essential work uh, and what were essential workplaces and what, were, what weren't. So in regards to maintaining social distancing in the workplace, it's something that we maintain is, is still beneficial and still helps prevent the spread of corona, corona, the coronavirus within Northern Ireland. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions on this statement. And by my reckoning, the Minister got to his feet at 14.54 hours, and it's now 15.57. And during that time, he answered 37 questions from members. So I want to thank the Minister for being here and answering the questions. And can I just, on a, and on a personal note, can I wish him every success in the job that he's undertaking, because your success is our success and it makes our community safer, so God bless. The next item on the agenda is a statement from the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. This meeting will suspend for around 10 minutes, and that's what we'll come back to. Thank you. Okay, members, agenda item three is a statement from the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. The Speaker's Office received notification on the 27th of April that the Minister wished to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at today's meeting. A copy of the statement that the Minister intends to, be make, intends to make can be found in your pack at page 15. I would like to welcome the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to this meeting of the Committee. I would also like to welcome Mr Dennis McMahon, Permanent Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, who is accompanying the Minister today. I will invite the Minister to make his statement, which should be heard without interruption. Following the statement, there will then be an opportunity for members to ask questions. And given how well we all did with the Minister for Health, if we could stick to that format, short, sharp questions without a long preamble or introduction. I call the Minister, Mr Edwin Putz. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I am grateful for the opportunity to update the Ad Hoc Committee today. I want to speak to you about the arrangements that are being made within my department to support the people of Northern Ireland in these challenging and indeed worrying times. 
As leaders, each of us must continue to do what we can to help everyone through this crisis. As well as impacting on the health of our people, this pandemic is also driving economic, social and environmental change. So while we need to address the problems of today, we also need to keep our eye to the future. The world will have changed in the aftermath of COVID-19 and we will have changed with it. So we must sustain our efforts to help and comfort each other through the personal challenges brought by this disease. We must work together and maximise cooperation between people, businesses and the public sector to get through these difficult times. We must address the economic and social challenges which we can see and which are now emerging in the wake of the public health impacts. And we must begin to plan to ensure that as we leave this dark hour, we are prepared to renew ourselves, our economy and our environment. As Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, I am committed to ensuring that we make every possible effort to protect the health and well-being of our staff, our customers and the general public, and to ensure that we continue to carry out our essential services safely. On the theme of working together, we have made it a priority to work with and support others across the system. This is consistent with our aim as a department because protecting the environment and public health are key priorities for DERA under all circumstances. And I am therefore very grateful that DERA has been able to provide Belfast City Hospital with 30 powered respirator units, which will undoubtedly contribute to saving lives. The Chief Veterinary Officer is working with the Southern Health and Social Care Trust to provide veterinary resources. And this will assist the COVID content tracing and also potentially provide assistance to healthcare professionals in the trust area. Our College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise has made over 20,000 coveralls and other personal protective equipment available to the Health and Social Care Trust and to colleagues in the Veterinary Service Animal Health Group. Some of these already have been collected. DERA continues to undertake a vast amount of work to ensure that we can deliver essential services to the people of Northern Ireland. And with your agreement, I will update you on that programme. As many of you will be aware, we have a huge spread of responsibility, including the agri-food industry, waste, fisheries, the environment and rural sector. Each and every one of us come into contact with at least one of these services on a daily basis, but most of the time they are hidden from view. Many people do not even realise that they are there, which is a good thing because it shows that they are working. However, if there is one thing that we have learned in the crisis, it is that we should cherish those services and never take them for granted. We provide food for some 10 million people, so it is crucial that our supply chains do not falter. I want to pay tribute to everyone across the private and public sectors, from farm to fork, for maintaining those supply chains so well. These supply chains are working effectively, thanks to the dedication and commitment of workers within the chain. It is entirely understandable that there have been concerns across stakeholders that staff may contact track this virus and they could be unable to work. I am grateful, therefore, to everybody who has helped put safety measures in place. When industry made calls for their key uh, workers to be tested for COVID-19, we listened. In fact, we have listened at every stage, meeting with industry at least once a week and for the majority of the crisis, two or three times a week. We are currently working with agri-food stakeholders to identify the categories and numbers of key workers, private and public sector, that could be tested to inform government planning exercises. Estimates from the Northern Ireland Food and Drinks Association suggest that output from the sector remains at around 100 per cent in terms of meeting customer demands. Levels of absenteeism are reported as having reduced to 8.5 per cent on average from a high of 14 per cent. As this crisis continues, however, there is concern that farm incomes could fall due to COVID-19 related slump in market prices. This could be made worse if farmers can't get their product to market or can't get feed or if input prices rise. We must ensure, as far as we can, that the flow of produce from farms is not interrupted. Thankfully, that has not happened to date, and hopefully the risk of it is receding. Although we cannot rule out future problems, Industry representatives have raised concerns that a sharp fall in beef prices is on the way. The latest market statistics show that beef prices, which had been stable since the beginning of the year, have started to fall. There are also concerns about what lies ahead for the dairy sector, as international markets have weakened considerably in recent weeks. And we know that there are difficulties 
within ornamental horticulture with dedicated growers facing major difficulties in getting produce to markets. I can assure you that my department is working diligently with representatives of the red meat sector and dairy sectors, listening, offering support and guidance. More importantly, we are taking action which, where we can. Officials are in daily contact with the industry <coughs> on those matters and have recently received independent analysis of the impacts of COVID-19 as having on both production and processing in the red meat industry. A similar industry-sponsored report for the dairy sector is expected by the end of next week. We are closely monitoring local, national and international markets to obtain information and intelligence. Both streams of work will go some way to help us to develop and deliver the type of support that may be needed to weather this particular storm. Moving on to fisheries, my department has provided a substantial scheme of £1.5 million worth of support for sea fish catching sector, and letters of invitation to apply for the scheme have been issued. Some vessels continue to fish where there is market for that catch, but overall activity is greatly reduced due to the market collapse for fish. There has also been a severe drop in sales of aquaculture pro products, and their officials have been gathering the relevant economic information to examine, examine the extent of the impact and what me measures might be necessary to support that sector. This includes <coughs> consideration of the recent amendment to the Eurotime, Maritime, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund which provides the possibility of grant financial compensation to aquaculture farmers for the temporary suspension or reduction of production of, as a result of COVID-19. Additionally, as a result of the drop in sales, increased stocking densities may increase welfare and disease issues, and the Department continues to engage with the sector in these matters. My officials have been working tirelessly with farmers to assist them in completing their single applications. <coughs> With less than three weeks to the closing date for single applications, DERA's single, advisory, single application advisory service will be available from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. over the weekends of the 5th to 6th of May and the 12th to 13th of May. We are providing enhanced advisory services and have seen a substantial increase in the number of applications that have been received to date. <coughs> the, latest figure <coughs> excuse me. the latest figure for received applications is 13,188. This represents 53% of the total number of applications expected in 2020, and an increase of 23% compared to the same date in 2019. I welcome the increased rate of applications by farmers and agents, and would encourage those with outstanding applications to act now. The deadline for entitlement transfers is the 4th of May 2020, and the deadline for single applications is the 15th of May <coughs> 2020. My department will continue to do all that it can to ease the burden and worries of people and businesses in rural communities. DERA officials are working in collaboration with a wide range of delivery partners in the statutory, community and voluntary sectors. In the past three weeks, I have secured £2.5 million for DERA for the 2021 Tackling Rural Poverty and Social Isolation Programme. I have pushed that support towards dealing with the immediate impacts of COVID-19 in the rural sector and have also fast-tracked over £2 million in payments to projects. These will support rural businesses and the community and voluntary sector, providing them with some degree of assistance and security during these difficult times. Rural Support has reported an influx of calls to their helpline on a range of issues. They include farmers worrying about benefits, their mental health and a possible slowdown in the supply chain. Rural Support continue to provide a listening ear and help, working in tandem with local councils and the Department for Communities. DERA, people and vehicles are delivering food parcels to the most vulnerable people in our communities, ensuring that they can keep safe. The Minister for Infrastructure and I recently confirmed a collective arrangement for rural community transport partnerships. These play a key role in delivering services to rural people and communities. Working in tandem with local councils and health trusts, the RCTPs are proving to be a very effective means of delivering food, medicine and other services to vulnerable people. Last week, I confirmed that forest and country parks were open for pedestrian access. And this is to provide people with open green spaces to exercise, consistent with public health advice on social distancing. In doing so, it is important that people maintain compliance with the COVID-19 regulations, including where there is reasonable excuse to travel for exercise. Car parks, as well as caravan, camping, angling, and associated facilities remain closed. DERA continues to deliver 
key public health and environmental protection messages around waste management. Messages include bin hygiene, respect for key workers, the importance of recycling and warnings against fly tipping. Waste industry workers have been designated as key workers, and I have issued a letter to all those working in the waste industry thanking them for their continued role, work and recognising their role. The waste sector is vitally important in safeguarding public health, protecting the environment and servicing the economy. Waste and recycling services are critical public services. They should be maintained as far as possible in order to protect the health of the Northern Ireland public from a build-up of waste, safeguard the important flow of materials such as those materials needed for food packaging and to deliver a low-carbon circular economy agenda. I recognise that there has been an increase in reports of fly tipping and have used a range of communications to remind the public that it is not only illegal but it is also damaging to public health and the environment. Our waste workers are already burdened with increased household waste, so fly tipping is a further burden on them. An added risk in dry weather is that fly tipping increases the risk of wildfires. And I have approved guidance to councils to inform their decisions on the reopening of household waste recycling centres. Clearly, these decisions will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. But as these services start again, when the time is right, they will help to reduce fly tipping incidents. I would also assure you that my officials in NIEA are closely monitoring the situation and working with our local councils. NIEA staff are continuing to operate their 24-hour pollution response service as part of their work to protect our water bodies. This is particularly important in catchments, which supply drinking water, and this is why scientific staff within our laboratories are prioritising their work on analysing raw water quality supplies, samples. This will support Northern Ireland's water provision of safe drinking water <clears throat> and effective wastewater treatment. In addition, NIEA's Drinking Water Inspector is working closely with NIEA Water to ensure it maintains the required drinking water standards for all of its customers and those who use a private water supply. I would also wish to acknowledge the valuable contribution of environmental non-government organisations and recognise the impacts of COVID-19 on that sector. Dear staff, continue to work with them and other government colleagues to understand and seek a way forward. I and my department remain fully committed to playing our part in tackling this crisis. We will ensure that every effort is made to mitigate the impacts of this pandemic. And importantly, we will understand that this means not only helping ourselves and our stakeholders, but also reaching out <coughs> and helping as many people as possible. As we push on and continue to deliver those essential services that we can deliver safely, it is important to remember that we will recover. Over recent weeks and months, we have been forced to live and work differently and to behave differently. I pay tribute to everyone that has played their part. But even in these darkest times, we need to look ahead. We owe it to everyone to ensure that everything we have learned in facing these challenges is put to good use. When planning for recovery, it is crucial that we do so in a holistic manner. Everything must work in tandem. Within DERA, we have developed new and innovative ways of working, travelling less, using less energy, finding new ways to communicate and to learn, and we must take this learning with us and use it in developing future plans. So I'd like to pay tribute to the staff throughout the wider agri-food industry, including my own staff in DERA, for their dedication and commitment um, through this time. For many of them, <clears throat> the impact of COVID-19 on their work is far more profound than just changing where they're working. It has also fundamentally changed the work that they do and how they do it. Rather than picking up where we left off, we must reimagine the future. We must work across government and with the private and voluntary community sectors to co-design <coughs> and deliver social and economic renewal. Sustainability must be at the heart of what we do, and economic renewal must better recognise the importance of our environment as a pathway towards a sustainable future. This will require collective commitment and action, and I recognise the important role that the Northern Ireland Executive will have to play. I will also continue to work with executive colleagues to do whatever I can to get us through the current crisis and play a full part in the development of our recovery plan for Northern Ireland. In my statement to this committee on the 7th of April 2020, I informed you that my department had already stated developing, started developing proposals to support the recovery of our economy, environment and people. This work is continuing, reflecting on our enforced experience of COVID-19 examining the lessons we can learn from it and how we can take them forward to optimise flexibility, productivity and resilience. 
and I look forward to sharing them with you in coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your statement. Um, again, folks, I just want to say there is more than nearly the guts of 20 people uh, looking to speak. Um, as I say, if we can have short, focused questions from members, and if we're going to ask members to do that, we should also ask the Minister short, focused answers from the Minister. Uh, the first person I wish to call is the Chair of the Committee, Mr Declan McAleer. Uh, uh, first off, I want to express my condolences to Minister Pooch on the sad passing of his father uh, last week. And um, no doubt, you know, the, your grief and that of your family has been compounded by the current COVID crisis and the requirements to maintain distance, uh, including that from your loved ones. So just want to pass on my condolences to you and thank you very much for uh, being here today. Uh, Minister, on page two of your statement, you made reference to the slump in the farm gate prices. And this is obviously due to many factors, uh, including the COVID that resulted in a severe carcass uh, imbalance and, with, and brought on by the closure of the food service industry. This has created a severe uh, crisis for the farmers. In terms of uh, um, support for the agri-food industry, we had received estimates last week, or the week before, last week and the week before, of a potential of a £105 million uh, package with the co-funded by the EU and the Westminster government to support the industry. I wonder, could you give us an update on where, we're, where we are at with that sort of a support package for the agri-food industry at this crucial time? Thank you. Can I thank the committee chair for uh, the qu question, and could also thank him for um, expressing his condolences and for doing that personally as well. And, and it is greatly appreciated to every member who has contacted me on a personal basis uh, to do that. And uh, it is something which um, I genuinely appreciate. In terms of the question that has been asked, um, we, we have been pressing um, the UK government, in particular, on this matter. So last week Europe produced a package which I believe amounted to €80 million Euros for all of Europe uh, in terms of aids to, largely aids to private storage, which is better than a poke in the eye, but it isn't a lot in terms of the, the crisis that exists across um, the European Union. And uh, we were looking at estimating a, a figure over the course of, of the next year of around €100 million required. Uh, for Northern Ireland, o o over £100 million. Pounds. So it demonstrates um, the scale of, of what we believe the problem will be and the response thus far. So I don't believe that neither Europe nor indeed the UK government have responded uh, in a way that, that is needed. Um, there is a holding back to see what's going to happen. Um, whilst it's quite evident some of the things that are going to happen, <coughs> in a very short space of time, the hospitality industry closed down, basically overnight, and with that, 40% of the trade uh, that is done uh, through the agri-food sector. So the consequence of it is very, very obvious. Whenever you are hit with a 40% of your trade disappearing, and yes, the retailers picked up um, a decent amount of trade, but they did not fill that gap or go anywhere near it. So I continue within the executive. I presented to the executive um, last week. Uh, on the issue of, of, of uh, our requirement for funding. Uh, we did receive £912 million. There's, I think there's something like £80 million left of that, and transportation has, has, has to take a, a call on that, and, and I recognise the importance of transportation, especially keeping our haulage industry going, keeping the ferries operating. Um, however, I would encourage the executive, and have encouraged the executive colleagues, not to spend that money just at this moment in time, and to ensure that there is something left for agriculture in the absence of UK government stepping up to the plate, albeit my focus continues to be in the UK government. I have got good support from my, my Scots colleagues and my Welsh colleagues, um, I, uh, and I think that we need to continue to maintain the pressure there because there is a problem, and it isn't a short-term problem. It is a problem that will last um, for probably close on a year. But the biggest issue is that this has been caused by COVID-19. We've helped other businesses to be there after COVID-19, and we need to ensure that we help the agri-food sector to be there, particularly given its importance to Northern Ireland. Mr McAleer, would you like to ask a supplementary? Um, I thank the Minister for his response. Um, and I'm sure the Minister will also con 
will welcome the confirmation recently that farmers can employ, uh, apply for the self-employed income support scheme. Um, but the Minister will also be aware that many farms, you know, particularly those in areas of natural constraint, don't make, uh, don't make any. They're lucky to break even year on year. So the self-employed scheme would not be um, of particular use to them. Would the Minister see any benefit of introducing like, a small grant scheme, not unlike the one that was introduced for the other, uh, by the Economy Minister for, for the other small businesses, to support the farm, those small farmers, even as an interim solution until there's a wider package agreed by the US Minister and the EU uh, Government? Thank you. Well, I think beef industry right across Northern Ireland made around eight million last year. So when you divide that across all of the beef farms, be the, 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 on the uplands or the lowlands, it's a very modest amount of money. Um, the dairy farms, I think, were, were making close, closer to 60 million, and all the projections is that they won't make anything this year going forward. So what, what I commit to is that uh, if we can get an envelope of money, I will I will come to the committee uh, before. Uh, the, 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 agri, uh, the, the, the DERA committee um, before we actually spend it to, to get the thoughts of, of the representatives here um, as to how that should be spent. So it'll, it'll not be some, I, I think that we need to personalise it for Northern Ireland uh, and, and for the people that we serve, uh, and therefore I'm happy to work with all of the colleagues here uh, if we can get an envelope of money to ensure that it is appropriately spent and, and goes to the sources where it needs most. Call Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her statement and also pass on my condolences to the Minister uh, on the passing of his father and assure him that our thoughts and prayers are with him and his family at this time. The Minister may be aware that uh, some farmers are finding it difficult to get their TB tests done. Uh, could the Minister further review the TB, TB tests and controls as a result of uh, COVID-19 to ensure that animals can be tested? while at the same time protecting human life? Thank you. There is a level of TB testing continuing. Some vets are furloughed, and some practices are not carrying out TB testing. So I can confirm that where practices aren't carrying out TB testing, and farmers in those areas need to have TB tests, they can go to a different practice. Now, previously, that was something which wasn't allowed. You had to go to the practice which was designated by the department. But if that practice is not actually in practicing in terms of TB testing, then you can go to a, a different veterinary practice. Um, and if the, uh, that veterinary practice is content that social distancing can be achieved, then that veterinary practice can carry it out. We have also um, further amended TB testing so that calves under the age of 180 days, up to six months of age, um, won't have to be TB tested. Um, therefore, farms which have young calves being born on them um, and need to move them on, those won't have to be TB tested uh, before they move. So we are, do recognise the issues and the problems that face the farming community in terms of TB testing and are seeking to work with the farming community uh, in, in, in providing that service to them. Do you like a supplementary, Mr Irwin? Thank you, Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his response and I thank the Minister for the fact that uh, animals uh, up to six months won't have to be tested. That will be uh, welcome. Um, is the minister aware that I uh, just won the other day in relation to department vets? Uh, the department was to test uh, a particular farmer, but they wouldn't do that and they wouldn't pass it on to his own vet to do. Uh, we did get it resolved in the end, but it can be an issue. Well, uh, once again, Irwin has delivered. Uh, as I said, he got a result in the end. So I'm glad that the department worked with you, Mr. Irwin, in, in, in getting a result. And I would hope that that will be the case with any MLA who brings an issue to my department, and that they'll get the cooperation uh, that they deserve. And if they don't get the cooperation that they deserve, feel free to contact me, and I'll try to help you to, to, to ensure that that happens. Call Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And Minister, I also wish to pass on my condolences to your family, uh, to your father, Charlie, and to your wife, who has passed away. Um, I know that he was a, a free man and a tireless worker within the community. Not always may I have seen eye to eye with him, but he was out there to help and he was out to do his possible best. Uh, I just want to also say it was 
I, I was disappointed I wasn't able to attend your house because just after the death of my mother, who died on a Thursday six weeks ago, that Friday night, the minister was first at my door at six o'clock, and I was to commend him for that. And I would love to have been able to go back and share with his grief at his family home. I'm sorry I wasn't able to. Minister, um, will you be aware that uh, many farmers reinvest any profits they have back into their farm, and therefore their profits returns are non-existent or minimal? Uh, these farmers may be disadvantaged by the self-employed scheme. Would the Minister have a view on how we could support these farmers? Minister. Um, just in terms of uh, your first comments, Mr. Mr. Katney, uh, I think it's what we should be doing in terms of how, how we deal with each other and, and have that respect for each other uh, in terms of um, uh, when there is family bereavements and so forth. And, and it was my privilege to, to attend your home at that time, and I regret that you weren't able to attend mine. Um, had it been a different scenario, you'd been very, very welcome, as would others. And that's, that's something of regret, but we just have to get on with it. Uh, in terms of what you raise, um, and it, it, it is extremely valid. Farmers tend to pump money back into their businesses, so the profitability is low. So they're repairing a roof if they can afford it. They're, they're, they're putting a bit more concrete down to tidy up a yard, whatever it happens to be, making something better for the animals so, so, it, so it is more comfortable for the animals, and sometimes more so in their own dwellings. Um, and as a consequence, the profitability is low. And therefore, <coughs> many of them will fall outside of the scheme. And that's why it is critical to us that we identify a source of funding, uh, wherever it's from, and I very much hope it's UK government. If it's not, I believe that this executive should step up to the plate, make that very, very clear, and have made that clear to the executive, so that they can provide support to keep these small business people, farmers are small business people, um, keep them afloat and allow them to continue to practice. There's 100,000 people who depend on the agri food business in Northern Ireland. And it is important that when we get to the other side of COVID 19, that we still have opportunities for 100,000 people and continue to grow that business um, beyond COVID-19. Would you like a supplementary? Um, yes, and thanks very much, Minister, uh, for your answers. And uh, uh, as I heard your statement there today, your department is also thinking, forward thinking, and how we can reinvest when we come out of this. And uh, uh, listening to Captain Tom, who has raised 30 million, and the British Prime Minister stating today that he was a light he was that beacon of light, and we need that beacon of light. That beacon of light can come through our existing uh, town centres and shop fronts that we have now. And if we learn nothing else from this, Minister, and that reinvestment that your department is going to do, it is that we need to think seriously about a campaign of shopping local and supporting those businesses that are on our doorsteps. A very valid point, and, and I'm happy to work um, with the Department for Enterprise, indeed the Department for Communities. <clears throat> Beyond this, in terms of the recovery plan of shopping local, because the best way of ensuring people buy local is to shop local, because the local businesses have traditionally supported the people in the local community, and they've been enticed away maybe from some of the local shops, and we've seen uh, the shutters go up and, and others just increasing their buying power. And it would be wonderful to see our butcheries and our bakers and our fruit and vegetable stores and, uh, and our artisan shops all making a comeback and actually grasp something good out of COVID-19. The lesson that we all need to know, learn, learn from any crisis is that there will be opportunities that arise as a result of a crisis, and we need to grab those opportunities with both hands and actually Restoring local business, locally owned business, would be really good for this country if that was something that came out of COVID-19. Before I call the next speaker, I would remind members, although I'm keen to give everyone a supplementary if they want to, that's not an obligation to take it. Um, and that's not, I'm not trying to put any particular pressure on Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, also may I convey my deep sympathy to you and your family on your recent bereavement. Um, Minister, I notice in your uh, statement today that you spoke about 53% of um, applications have, they ex 
53% of the expected number of applications you've already received for the single farm payment, single farm application. This, these are due in the 15th of May. That is coming very, very close. In the West, you know, we have broad, broadband issues. I don't need to reiterate them. Is there any possibility, given that, given with COVID and given with many of these people uh, get support throughout the community and the social distancing, etc., that those um, applications, the receipt of them could be put back a week, 10 days to help them? Thank you, Mrs. Barton, for the question, and, and again, it's very valid. Um, it's tremendous that there's 53 per cent at this stage, so we're 20 per cent ahead of what, what happened in previous years. That's good. Um, but I recognise that it will be a struggle for everyone, and particularly when they're relying on, on others who are form-filling and there isn't the same opportunities to call it a farm and, and, and get all of it down there, um, that it's going to be more challenging to do it, and accuracy and all of that, there will be a challenge. So at this moment in time, People need to get their forms in, and if they're concerned that it's not entirely accurate, they've got to the 9th of June to, to, to amend it, which gives them a bit of time without there being any penalty. I, I don't think now is the appropriate mm -hmm. time uh, to take the, the foot off the pedal. So whenever farmers are doing very well, if, if I said the day, uh, put it back to the 30th of May today, then I might be pushed to put it back to the 15th of June or, or whatever. I could put it back for, for a month, not a problem. But I don't want to put back the payment on the, on the 16th of October for a month. Consequently, I want to keep, keep the pressure on, get as many of these applications in as possible. We'll see if there's a real problem towards the end of it. We'll try to address it, try to, to, try to work with people. But at this moment in time, I think that the best thing to do is to keep the focus on the 15th of May, and let's see what we can achieve by the 15th of May. I, I'll not be surprised if, if, if the farming community have 98, 99 per cent of them in at that point, and there's very little excuse for the, for the, the remaining one or two per cent at that stage, but we'll see how it goes. Mrs. Martin, for a supplementary. Um, if you give me a slight leeway, I just want to also make comment on uh, broadband, deer and broadband, and it's just to say I find it a little bit disturbing to know that deer that there's 14.3 million has been set aside for digital transformation within the budget for DERA, but yet broadband 7.5 million. I would have thought perhaps with the need that we have for broadband at the moment out in the community that it should have been the other way around. Okay, well, I'll defer that one to my permanent secretary. In fact, uh, my, my, my expectation is that that money should be going to broadband, um, so I'll just need to, I'll need to have a look at that. Thank you. Good question. Well, Mr. John. Right. Mr. John Blair. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. And can I uh, begin by uh, adding my condolences and those of my party colleagues uh, to, to condolences already expressed? And in addition to that, pay tribute to the Minister and the seriousness with which he takes these uh, pressing and crucial issues that he's back here so promptly and back to business and answering our questions. In addition to that, can I ask? following his appropriate thanks to those involved in the supply chain, if he shares my concern that we may need additional workers to enable the harvest to happen effectively this year, although it is still early in the year, so as that we may not be yet seeing the strain. There are, um, I'm sure you'd agree, possibilities that the need for social distancing and the lack of migrant workers could create pressures there. We in Northern Ireland don't have the same fruit market that exists perhaps in, in other parts. So, um, certainly in the south of England, the, the strawberries and raspberry growers are, are facing problems now, and, and we see plain loads of people arriving from Romania and people criticising that. You know what? I'm glad of those people from Romania coming in to do it because the government actually offered people who were furloughed the opportunity of actually keeping their furlough money and going to work on these farms and people chose not to do it. So thank you to the people who, who, who actually come in to do it. Um, we in Northern Ireland wouldn't have the same pressures. The apple industry is the one which is um, least automated, and consequently they need quite a bit of help in the autumn time. Um, but that's an issue that uh, we will keep an eye on and address as we get closer to that time. 
and uh, I'm sure Mr Irwin and, and the new RMA and, and maybe some of the upper band colleagues uh, will keep our attention on that matter if, if that arises. Mr Blair. Supplementary, Principal Deputy Speaker, and that does the Minister agree that we, we may well need cross-sector and cross-departmental attention to try and address issues if they arise? I, I do. Call Mr Harry Harvey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Minister. Firstly, can I say publicly that I am sorry for your loss in the recent passing of your dear father, Charlie. Indeed, it is with fond memories that he served here and was a member in this House. 73 on 1975, along with my father, Cecil. Minister, on forest and country parks, I do welcome clarity given by you in relation to the use of these services. Can I ask the Minister how this is working out in practice? Well, I thank the member for the question. And, and to date, we have had no issues raised with us from anybody in the public. Um, it appears to be working well. We have sought to discourage people from travelling and from certainly travelling long distances. Uh, we have kept the car parks locked so that people will not be encouraged to, encouraged to travel, so it is more local people that are using the facilities. Um, there will be no ice cream vans or coffee vans or anything else in them either, for that matter, as things stand, and, and that is that's how it will have to be for, for the foreseeable. Um, I should say that we have encouraged people to use one-way systems within the parks, um, so uh, it has worked extremely well in terms of social distancing, and I welcome the opportunity for people to be able to get out into the fresh air. It's good for their physical health, it's good for their mental health. We want people to use these services, that's why they're here. We pay for the Northern Ireland public pay for this, and we want the Northern Ireland public to benefit from it, and they are benefiting from it in a way which will not contribute uh, to any upsurge in COVID-19. I want to give you more or less answers there, and that was on car parking. Um, no availability, but you obviously say that everything's working out fine. So that's grand. Thank you. I don't think you need to respond to that. No. Um, I call Ms Emma Sheeran. Oh my, I get the pre last King Corley. And thank the Minister for his statement and echo the condolences to you and the death of your father. Um, just following on from Ms Barton's question, and I know I've written to you about this as well, uh, in light of the COVID crisis that we find ourselves in and the fact that we have social distancing requirements and DERA star staff working from home, farm agents are working remotely as well and a, a lot of farmers aren't able to go and speak to their agents the, the way they would have previously. Will there be flexibility granted to farmers that have missed or are going to miss the 4th of May deadline for the transfer of their SFP entitlements? We, we haven't set in flexibility <coughs> for the entitlement transfers at this stage, so there is flexibility in terms of mistakes on, on the single farm payment, um, but it's certainly something that we can give consideration to you if, if that is required. I appreciate that. I just want to reiterate that I know in the response that I received, you referred to the online form. And I know a lot of my own constituents with poor broadband and a lot of farmers are elderly, obviously, in rural isolation, but accessing this online isn't always ideal. So I appreciate that. I respect that there as well. And I know that, for example, in, in our area, Sky broadband went down for, I think, 48 hours there recently. So as we get closer to the time, that could very easily happen and cause a distortion in the community. So we need to recognise always delivers. Come, Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Uh, again, and um, uh, can I extend my condolences to the Minister and share him with our thoughts and prayers at this time? Minister, back again to single farm payment. And I note from your statement that we're 23 per cent higher. Uh, this year than we were this time last year with the applications, and with the high, as was high level of applications, are you confident that the basic uh, scheme payments can be delivered by mid October, or will this process um, will it be a longer process? I'm very hopeful that <coughs> the, the farming community will respond. The, the, the 15th of May is a date that that they recognise needs to be met every year, um, so people <coughs> people have started well. Uh, and uh, that has continued to be the case. So there's been no drop-off. It's, it's been an increase. And uh, I think that if, if, if we encourage people to keep at it, um, I believe that we can get most of these forms in in time. Mr. Buchanan. 
the Minister for that. And given the, the, uh, that we're in the midst of the COVID-19 and staff are working from home, it's much more difficult for, for staff and so forth. Can the Minister give an assurance that staff will be at hand to give that needed advice and assistance to farmers perhaps that does have a difficulty with their single farm payment application? We have more telephone helplines <coughs> than, than, than ever, and we're also offering a, a helpline at weekend service. So it's, I think it's 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock um, on Saturday and Sunday. So th that will be an additional service uh, which is provided to people um, for the two weekends before the 15th of May. Commissioner Ennis. Um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too echo, echo the sentiments expressed on the passing of your father, uh, Minister. Um, communities and farmers alike have been sounding the alarm about the, the increase, the surge in uh, flight hipping and, and illegal dumping. Um, and I'm wondering, has the, has the Minister, has the Department sought to, to keep track of the, of the level of that? Um, and have you looked at any COVID proof um, policy initiatives to, uh, to combat that highly irresponsible and, quite frankly, disgusting activity? Yeah, NIA have been working with local authorities in terms of, of, of tracing and identifying and supporting them uh, in terms of uh, fly tipping, and it has increased. It hasn't increased alarmingly, but it has increased, and, and that, 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 that is a significant issue uh, for us to deal with. In terms of it, um, we have set out principles. They weren't my principles. I happen to agree with the principles that NIA produced. Um, but they produced the principles um, without um, any political guidance. And uh, those principles have now been issued to councils on dealing with the household waste centres. And I would hope that um, the councils will respond. So, for example, uh, in Mid-Ulster recently, we had an issue where the fly tipping um, was set alight, what started a gorse fire, and created a, a secondary problem. So, I think it would be appropriate for, 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 it's for councils mm -hmm. to make their own decisions, uh, and their independence is something that uh, they cherish, and I respect that. Uh, but I hope that the guidance enables them uh, to make decisions which will allow them uh, to better manage waste. Thank you, Minister. And if you'll indulge, indulge me, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, just to go off topic slightly. Um, We've heard a lot, and we all have, know from our own experience um, how rural um, clubs and rural communities are at the coalface of, of the civic response to COVID-19. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would appeal and I would implore and ask the Minister um, if he will consider uh, implementing a, a rural development programme um, by way of, of a, of a post-COVID stimulus package, especially for rural communities, um, and whether he has engaged with the Shared Prosperity Fund in order to bring that forward. I actually have a written statement ready to go on, on rural needs, and I, I wanted to include it in this oral statement, actually, but I was told by officials that it actually needed to go out in, in written form, so we will be getting that, and I think that we will be in a position to respond to that. Um, we have a lot of work to probably do with the Department for Communities in terms of meeting rural needs, um, and there is, work that they, uh, there is money that they have for sporting clubs, for example, um, and indeed for charities. Um, £22 million pounds came through there for charities. Uh, so <coughs> the, the, they're the department that has the, the, the finances on that. But I would hope that all of that doesn't stay in urban areas, not that I've anything against urban people, um, but uh, it should be something which is spread across the communities and, of course, include rural communities. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, whilst there's much in this House that will divide us, there's humanity that brings us together. And many of us know uh, the loss of a parent and the loss of a father. And I offer my condolences to uh, the Minister on his loss. Um, and I, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, welcome the um, support that there has been for the fishing communities. The, that £1.5 million has been of great benefit uh, to those within the uh, fishing communities within my constituency in, in Arglass and in Kilkeel. Could I ask the Minister, maybe, has there been any planning within the department, just given that the nature of the fish going into the restaurant businesses and going into that food sector, given that it's not likely to be back on its feet again in two months, three months, or maybe even six months, is there any long-term planning uh, towards supporting those industries? Well, there is indications at this point that um, markets, some markets are starting to, to open up again. So, you're absolutely right. The fish that we catch locally, we don't use locally. 
There is about, about 30 per cent of it and about 70 per cent of it exported. And then the fish that we actually use is about 70 per cent imported. So um, we like our cod and chips on a Saturday night. Um, others like, uh, like, like our nephrops or our prawns. Um, and a lot of that goes to the Far East and a lot of it goes to the continent. Uh, the Far East market would appear to be beginning to open up, but it's going to be a while because a lot of the containers and the chilled containers and so forth are actually have, have been in China and they need to be got out um, to start movement again. Uh, so we will watch the markets and we will work to support the industry and work with the industry. At this stage, there is still quite a lot of buying going on. Um, that stuff's going into that material is going into cold stores. Ultimately, that has to be sold at some stage. So it'll probably it'll probably mean that the price of fish will not rise any time soon. Uh, so even if the markets were opened up again, and then of course we're all living with this cloud of a second outbreak uh, over us, and we're finding it challenging to deal with the first outbreak. So we don't exactly know what the future holds, uh, but we just need to be prepared to be flexible whenever that comes along. Mr. McGrath, for supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and also likewise, just in the aquaculture sector, um, I know that there was some difficulties in the funding that it really from the first of April was going to be under pressure anyway. Um, has there uh, is there more of a breakdown to what support there is for that sector? I know there were some interim measures that were being considered. Are we on the interim measures, or has there been the the, the new funding stream set up for them yet? Because they likewise are caught in this uh, at this time as well. The aquaculture is <coughs> relatively small, um, so in terms of funding that, you know, w w we probably can, can meet that sort of thing with, within our own resource without looking elsewhere. Um, however, the department is working and, and has been working um, on that particular issue and seeing how it can help aquaculture, but we haven't, haven't been given a paper yet as to, as to how, how, how we might proceed in that. Call Mr Mike Nesbitt. I'd like to echo the sentiments and the loss of the minister, uh, Father. Uh, I was going to ask about the implications for seasonal workers like fruit pickers, but you've covered that. Uh, so if you'll allow me to perhaps move on from the, the statement a little bit, but it's in the area of your concern uh, for farm incomes. Uh, the Executive Office Committee got a briefing yesterday from lead officials on EU exit, saying the policy was uh, no loss of spending power through Brexit. Is that your department's policy and do you think it's ambitious enough or should we actually be looking to become better off? Well, obviously we want to be better off than, than where we are now and particularly given that for a lot of um, people within the farming community, um, they have seen their, their, their profits go down to, to basically flatline. Um, they need to be better off going forward. The UK is a, a net importer of foods. Um, we have seen a circumstance where um, we, we, we have, have the current situation where that food supply has kept going and it's been a bit more challenging to get food exported. And uh, that could give us an indication of, of what could happen um, post Brexit. However, it depends on whether there's no deal or, or whether there's, there's a deal. Uh, if there's no deal, then there's tariffs applied, both, way, both ways, and that will mean that much more food um, produced locally will be used locally. Uh, so, <clears throat> whilst, we, whilst we encourage a deal, um, and whilst we, we, we want there to be a deal, because that's probably in the, the interest of, of wider industry, um, it might not be in the interest of agriculture, because most of our, our products can be sold and used within, within, within the UK, albeit we do sell a lot of dairy products to, to Europe, to Africa, to the Far East. Um, we do um, sell a lot of lamb to Europe, um, but we're also importing vast quantities of cheeses, um, wine, which we don't produce here, obviously, um, um, pork products, uh, and m m many beef, for that matter, uh, from Europe. So, it's going to be complicated when we leave Europe. I mean, no doubt about that. But I believe that we can overcome those complications because we've got um, the spirit and the will to do it. And our response to coronavirus demonstrates that we'll have that. Mr. Nesbitt. 
Minister will allow me to stretch even further from the statement. Yesterday we, we were talking about the Shared Prosperity Fund and the officials in the Executive Office could only tell us that it's been led by the Department of Finance. Has the Minister uh, and his department uh, been engaged by, by finance about this, this fund and, and what is its potential? has been getting information on the fund um, and right the way through we have, uh, I think um, the, the officials have been trying to get more information um, and we've also put in prior to the resumption of the Assembly as well those, those uh, proposals put in as well that we should at least get the same level of funding as we had before um, but at this stage we're still waiting on the outcome of that. I might add Thank you. Um, we have a paper there which would indicate that we could claim do more in terms of state aid post Brexit than we currently have the capacity to do. So that, that's, that's a good, good thing. And that, um, whilst we might be able to reach the ceiling, at least, at le at least it's, it's not something that's going to hold us down. Call Mr. Paul Fruit. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, and I, I'll take the risk of not having a supplementary because uh, I'm sure the Minister will respond accordingly to my first question enough, sufficiently enough. Can I ask the Minister, given the issue and the debates we have had in this House and, and across the globe around climate change, and given the fact that we're in a very unique position whereby a lot of business and industry has stopped but farming has continued, can the Minister outline what areas his department is looking at with regards to scientific evidence to ensure that the farming industry moving forward will be able to help in the fight uh, around pollution and climate change? I could give a very long answer to that, but don't worry, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I heard you earlier on. Uh, the population hasn't decreased, nor indeed has agriculture changed over the course of the last six or eight weeks. But we have seen an, an improvement in the climate. We have seen a reduction in greenhouse gases, and all of that has happened um, in that particular scenario. And that would give me evidence, which I have always uh, sought to promote from the last time I was Environment Minister, that much of what happens within agriculture is actually circular, and there is a lot of capture of carbon, which people choose to ignore but only want to concentrate on the output. And I think that beyond us here, we need to have governments right across the world looking to see how various agricultural practices best promote that circular um, uh, envir environment where, where, where the greenhouse gases are reduced because there's a capture and not just look at the emissions. Uh, and if you, look at, if, you, if you look at the one without looking at the other, you're not getting a proper analysis of it. And I think that, given the circumstances that we now live in, it's been demonstrated very, very clearly that agriculture is not the problem when it comes to the environment that some people have suggested that it has been in the past. Before I call uh, Mrs Martina Anderson, could I remind members to please questions should be related directly to the statement that the Minister has given. Um, but I'll only slap you on the wrist because you didn't take a supplementary. So thank you. I call Ms. Martina Anderson. Good morning, I'll give the last three uh, can call you. And I too want to extend my deepest sympathy uh, to the Minister and your family on the death of, of your father. Horrendous time to, to lose a parent. Uh, you recently confirmed, as you said in your statement, around the collective arrangements that have been put in place for the Rural Community Transport Partnerships. And could you give us some details of how that collective arrangement is working between yourself and the Infrastructure Minister? Well, I was delighted that uh, our two teams could get together on this issue. And, uh, you know, the, the Rural Transportation Partnership um, community partnership has for years been collecting people who have ha ha had trouble travelling from, from rural areas into towns, brought them into the doctors, brought them into the, the, the shops and, and enabled them to have that part of their, their life continue. But as a consequence of, of COVID, um, those services weren't needed. Um, 
because, well, the doctors are still needed, but certainly to go to shops and to go to the town. Uh, so people need to be flexible, mm -hmm. and, and we have been flexible, and have identified well, the need still exists. They needed those goods before, and they needed transport to, to go and get those goods. So instead of them having to go to the town, we'll bring the town to them. So that is basically it. The service is taking the needs, uh, or taking, taking the, the, the goods um, to the homes of those people that need it. And uh, I was delighted to be able to work with the Department of Infrastructure uh, in doing that. And I think it's a significant uh, demonstration of how the executive does work together. People don't want to focus on, on, on a few arguments that we we'll have. And those arguments very often are a microcosm of what's actually taking place in the public. Um, but there's an awful lot of good working practices together, and that's one of them. Mrs. Anderson. Thank you, Minister, uh, for, for that answer, and I concur with what you said about the importance of that uh, connectivity and the collective nature of the executive. And in that vein, you had mentioned the uh, rural needs and uh, a statement coming out, and I wonder if you're going to elaborate on that around any collective arrangement, perhaps between yourself and the Health Minister, on the issue that you touched on in your statement today around mental health. I think mental health in the rural community, it doesn't have services like, for instance, when you talked about the urban, urban areas like Derry, when I think of Hurt or Inspire or, or the services that we have, the dedicated services, there's very few dedicated mental health services. So is that something that you're going to take forward? There's two issues which have risen significantly as a result of COVID, um, which we are aware of. One is people's mental health. And the other one is domestic violence, and I believe it's incumbent upon the executive um, to seek to support communities uh, on both those areas, um, and it's very often connected. Um, so, mental health uh, is a big, big issue. It's a big issue in rural communities. It has been an issue which has led to, to the, the, the ultimate in terms of people taking their own lives. Um, and the ability to do that in rural communities has always been greater because of the availability of, of, of the means to do it. So we do have our organisations within, within health. Um, there are a wide range of or, other, or within, agri, within the, the rural, rural affairs side of our department. Um, health has, has also provided significant support to organisations uh, which are freely available to everybody in the community. Um, but I suspect we're probably not doing enough. So there's always an area that if we can identify um, how best we can meet that need, um, we need to be responding to that. And again, I'm happy to work with colleagues in the committee uh, in, in doing that. Commissioner Paul Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Minister, please accept my sincere uh, sympathies as well in the passing of your father. Um, I'm just coming to your statement there where you said that on the 7th of April, you said your department was starting to develop some proposals for rebuilding the economy, etc. I, I represent a, an urban constituency, and obviously we've been very hard hit in terms of the closure of our hotels and restaurants, for example. Just wondering how you're going to be working with the Department of the Economy for post-pandemic about how we can start um, recreating that codependence between the agri-food industry and our hospitality sector. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, in terms of recovery, um, the executive have started to do a course of work on recovery, so that's, that's across all departments. Recovery, um, you know, economically, is, is very important. It's not just about the economy, though. We need a recovery in our health, health service because we had waiting lists which were horrendous before this happened. Those waiting lists will be even worse. We have people who haven't been having the screening that they should have been having. Um, we have you know, dentists who aren't, aren't practicing at the minute and they, they're regularly catching out cancer and, and, and oral cancer and so forth. So we're going back to major problems in, in health. We're going back to major problems in education. And we're going back to, to major problems in, in the economy. The economy <coughs> that we left is not the economy that we returned to. I think with the best will in the world, we are not going to get the numbers of tourists for a number of years that we, we would have been getting you know, for a full year like last year. So those, those are issues that we need to be on top of. How do we actually change our economy? How do we look at, at where the benefits are. So, for example, there are many thousands of people who worked in large cities um, in Great Britain who have returned home. 
and they are continuing to work. So do they need to return back to the big cities? Or can we keep those people here? Because those people will help us to drive that economy upwards again, because they'll need to buy houses. They'll be bringing in money from, from their jobs, which are based elsewhere. Um, but if they're living here, they'll be going to the restaurants here. They'll be going to all of the services that exist here. So as an executive, we need to look at all of the opportunities that exist. And we need to work collectively to harness those opportunities, to create as many jobs here as possible, to seek to replace jobs that have been lost through no fault of anybody, anybody other than this COVID-19, and to restore our economy. It's going to be a major challenge. It's not going to be easy. Um, but it's a course of work that we must do, um, because if we don't do it and do it well, then a lot of people will, will face hardship as a consequence. And Ms Bradshaw is right, she actually represents the finest constituency in Northern Ireland. I call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, commend the uh, Minister for his very swift return to work? I'm not sure he actually ever left it um, on the death of his dad. And we, our thoughts are, of course, with him um, at this time. Um, Minister, I was going to ask you about uh, the fly tipping, and, and I was. Um, um, heartened by the uh, phased reopening of recycling centres within South Antrim, that has been announced. It's very much welcome um, in, in the area. But to move on to another topic within your statement, um, and you'd touched upon the 24-hour um, pollution response service um, protecting the, the water bodies. And um, Minister, I've been doing a little bit of. Uh, scientific work of my own, uh, which involves uh, one very energetic uh, lab Kelpie cross within my house, who loves to swim. And because mm -hmm. I live in Antrim, he regularly swims in the six mile water and also at the Antrim Rock Shore and Ray's Wood area. And he has been a, a, a mad keen swimmer, really, since he was a very small pup. And that's four years and going on. But what I'm trying to get to is the water actually regularly made him sick. And he had numerous vets visits and whatnot before we discovered the common denominator, what was making him sick, and it was the water, and quite obviously pollution. He's been very happily swimming for weeks with no ill effects. So I'm just wondering, Minister, is there an opportunity here? Is there, is there something going forward, uh, some kind of encouragement uh, that we can take from this? Um, and how do you manage going forward as industry does return to normal? And how do we stop the pollution of our waters? Yeah, the Six Mile Water is a tricky one because there has been pollution quite a number of times there, which we've never identified the source of. And uh, that's not for the want of trying, but we're pretty sure it is an industrial source. and. and you know the anecdotal evidence that, that, that you have found yourself um, would, would seek to endorse that because obviously agriculture is continuing and, and, and that, that, that hasn't been a cause of the problem there. So we do need to continue to work to, to um, you know, ta tackle the issues around water pollution. Um, I remember reading about the River Lagan, for example, that it was full of salmon and trout. Um, many, many years ago, before the Industrial Revolution. And whilst the Industrial Revolution was fantastic in that it created you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs and, and we were really at the cutting edge you know, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, there was an environmental impact. So whilst we seek to develop this recovery plan and do all of that, we need to always ensure that the environment is front and centre in terms of how we do it. Um, so we can create a better environment. I think one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us is that we do not need to fly as much. We do not need to drive as much. Uh, there's a lot of people who have found that working from home is very, very good. It's good for their mental health. Uh, it's, it's good for their family life. Um, I think my wife has found that maybe too much of me at home, but nonetheless, most other people will, will probably be happy enough. But seriously. Um, it, it, it is going to these Zoom meetings and all, it's absolutely fantastic. And there's no reason going forward 
that that, that isn't something that, that can be continued. We don't, once this is over, we don't need to drop what has been good practice, and that's what we've been referring to in the statement. We need to identify those things that have been good and hold on to them and use that going into the future because the less planes that are flying and the less cars that are driving, it's fairly evident to me um, that that will be good for the environment. Ms Cameron for a supplementary. Mr. Um, and thank you for those comments. Um, and I would agree with you that I think all of life has changed right now and um, we should take the positive out, out of that and continue that change. And I also want to commend um, your department for their help uh, in dealing with the crisis and in particular CAFRA and their work in uh, making PPE. I think that's very welcome. I just want to make that comment to you. Thank you. Call Mr. Philip McGuigan. Gura Melgut, Priyo Las Can Corlia, and uh, can I uh, as well uh, pass on my condolences to the Minister and his family on the loss of his father? And just following on from the previous question, uh, I mean, obviously, a global pandemic, pandemic costing many people their lives and many people their livelihoods uh, and businesses shouldn't be seen a way of bringing about change in our environment. But as the Minister has, and others have pointed out, uh, that has been uh, a, a result of it. Uh, I mean, it's no secret that worldwide greenhouse gases have dropped significantly over this last number of weeks. Uh, there's less air pollution, and there have been many more positive environmental changes. The previous question about uh, water quality is just one. Obviously, locally and on the micro scale, uh, it's also been pointed out there's been some negatives with regard to fly tipping and uh, uh, the burning. Uh, of woodland and shrubbery, etc., etc. But uh, in light of all of that, can I ask the minister if uh, his department is continuing to or carrying out uh, testing here in the north of the environmental impact uh, and if, of lockdown, and if he can maybe give us some sense of what that is? Yeah, our, our water, water quality unit continues to carry out its tests and data, uh, all of those, and continue to engage in, in the work that, that they need to do. Um, any reports of, of pollution will, will be followed up. Uh, so some of the, 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 the checks that have been taking place, for example, on-farm checks, have had to be, have to be stopped. Um, but in terms of, of the, the, that work where there is any pollution, um, that will be responded to. Um, water is still being tested to ensure that it's fit for human consumption. So there is still a series of work. Work is not closed down on, on, on our front. I can assure you. Briefly, uh, I mean the minister ha has alluded to rebalancing and reorganising uh, the economy and reprioritising how we maybe do business. And I note comments yesterday from uh, his uh, executive colleague in the, the Department of Infrastructure about. You know, protecting the environment, or maybe protecting some of the positives that have that have come out uh, of this. And in his statement, he mentions that he intends to come forward with that. As the minister responsible for the environment, you know, how soon and will you be working with the rest of your uh, executive colleagues to bring back uh, before the house some changes? Because as we can all identify, good habit is good. But if we allow ourselves maybe to drift back to Bad habits that are, have negative impacts, then we, you know, the hard, it'll be hard to undo those. The, the executive has set out that they want to develop a recovery plan, and for me, the environment is, is front and centre of that recovery plan. Um, any recovery plan which ignores um, the environment is, is one which is doomed to fail. Call Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I join with others in, first of all, offering my condolences um, to the Minister and in particular to thank him for clearly um, what has been dedication to his role um, while he's been going through the grieving process. Um, whatever about people's party affiliation, it's important that we note that commitment um, and that, uh, during a time like this. I also welcome his commitment to a changed um, economy in the future. We've all acknowledged that we can't go back to the way things were. I'm sure others in the House will agree that I hope the barbers reopen because I can't go on that much longer without a haircut. Um, but my question is about um, a subject on which we probably haven't agreed in the past, um, but I hope we can have some agreement, at least in the short term, and that is the difficult subject of Brexit. He talked in his, um, one of his answers to the earlier questions about um, European markets, continental markets, both for our farmers and our fisheries. Would he agree with me that 
it is going to be very difficult in the months ahead for the UK and EU to conclude a comprehensive trade deal that will secure continued access to the mar those markets. Would he agree with me that it would be good if the executive could come together to ask for an extension? And let me just preface this before I um, ask him to answer it with the statement that I completely respect his support for Brexit, and this is without prejudice to the final relationship between the UK and EU. You don't have to agree on Brexit. You don't even have to agree on the implementation of the Ireland Protocol, simply to agree that neither our farmer nor farmers nor our fishermen can live with us. And coming out of the transition period at the end of this year, in a chaotic way, we need an extension, even if it's just in the short term. I recall when I was at school, there were two kinds of people. There were people who were extremely organised and could have things all done and set out and, and completed. You know, they handed in their school project a, a week in advance and all of that there. And then there were others who um, could not never get it in on time, no matter what that time was. Um, I would have tended to fall into the latter category, by the way. But I think that the longer you keep delaying and delaying and delaying and putting things back, um, you just give that opportunity for, for people not to focus. And again, it, it, is, it is not a decision that this executive will take. It is a decision which is, will be taken at, at Westminster in terms of the timings. Uh, at, this, at this point, and I've been at a number of meetings where it has been raised, all of the indications are that they are, are sticking to, to, to the, the current date. And that, 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 is, that is where we exist. It's above my pay grade um, to change it, even if I desire to do it. Before I call the member for a supplementary, I would remind him the Minister's statement relates to COVID-19. And that was quite long and not directly related to the Minister's statement. Call the member for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. My follow-up does specifically relate to COVID-19, and that is, and it may be one that he, uh, the official may want to come in on. Um, we may not agree in the short term on Brexit extension, though I hope um, fisheries and farmers will be able to make their voice heard in the months ahead. Can I just ask either the minister or the official to indicate how many of Department, the department staff who have been working previously on Brexit and its implementation or the implementation of the Ireland Protocol have been reassigned either in whole or in part to work on COVID-19. Do you have both the overall global number and the proportion of that as a member of the, as a, the DERA workforce? specific breakdown on that, but part of the reason for that is that um, in the early days, this has changed during the course of the pandemic. So in the early days, just about everybody who was able to work was working purely on the pandemic for a period of time. Having said that, we have kept a core team working on the policy issues as they've arisen because we've had to, because Westminster has uh, so many resources that we've had to be able to respond as best we can during the course of it. So that has varied over time. But I could give you um, a picture. I can, I can find uh, the current picture and respond to you in writing, if that's helpful. I call Mr Justin McNulty. Gurmay Yoga Tulas, Count Corla. And can I thank the Minister for his statement and for his answers thus far. And can I join with other members in offering my sincere condolences for the loss of your father, Charlie? Minister, you refer to waste recycling centres. Um, I have been contacted by a number of constituents who are concerned about the build-up of rubbish after spring clean and um, or who are also really annoyed by the rise in the revolting practice of fly tipping. Does the Minister deem recycling as an essential service, both from an envir environmental perspective and from a public health perspective? And furthermore, does he consider Travelling to a recycling centre as an essential journey. Well, <clears throat> waste material tends to gather things which you don't want, such as rats and mice and, and, and vermin. So, having waste material lying in, the, in, in your back garden is, is not a good thing. It attracts the, the, the wrong sources, and therefore the opportunity for people to dispose of it is something which I think is, is necessary. Um, I note that. Uh, Lisburn Castle Ray Council, um, prior to opening recycling centres, are going to put bin lorries in, in certain places where people can bring their bags just and leave them. Um, so, for example, at, at the, the Ulster Grand Prix racecourse, up, uh, uh, at where the circuit is, and there's plenty of space to do it. People will come and leave their bags off, and, and the bin lorries will, 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 will uh, take those away. Um, 
So we do need to, to look at the opportunities of, of get, getting rid of this material. Um, we also have issues in that a lot of the recyclables um, are moved on into industry. So we have facilities which are, are, are using this material to generate electricity, and that is now becoming an issue, not just here, but right across the uh, United Kingdom. So we need to ensure that, that there is a flow of material um, where people have made a large investment in ensuring that we have a circular industry and that we're generating electricity from um, a source which was previously a waste source um, and um, using that material as fuels. So I, I believe that it is something that is necessary. Um, I believe the recycling targets and all that we have set haven't been set for, for no particular reason. They've been set for good reason. And we are falling back from those at this moment in time. So we need to get focused and get back to, to delivering on that and ensuring that we can do it. So yes, I, I do think that our recycling and our recycling centres are something which are extremely important, extremely important to the local communities. Mr. McNulty. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can I applaud your decision to reopen the marts? I think if you're watching the BBC News last night, you will see my neighbours, Oliver and Fiona McCann, arriving at uh, Market Hill. Uh, they reopened marts and they were selling their stock, and they were very relieved to be able to get an income, a, a further income at, at this time of need. Um, and they also applauded the operation of, of uh, Market Hill Mart in a different uh, stance in that the sellers couldn't be with their stock, but they were thought they were, thought they were treated fairly and appropriately. Minister, I was, I was excited to hear you talk about reimagining the future. And now, farmers and people working in the agri-food sector, by their nature, are hard-working, industrious, innovative and resourceful. Their passion and expertise should be welcomed and embraced. Minister, can you tell me how that future might look and how that will provide comfort and security for the people who are now very, very uncertain and fearful about the future? One thing about the, f the farming community more than most is their resilience. And resilience is something which is incredibly important. Uh, it's incredibly important to everyone, and, and it's one of the problems that we have in terms of mental health is a lack of resilience. And we have seen over the years farmers who, who, who that they didn't have enough, enough money on the farm to keep the, the, the young people at home. And they went out and, the, and the, they learned trades. And many of those young, young people um, went on to establish businesses. And you'll find that a lot of those businesses in quarry crushing and, and manufacturing um, various engineering products and, and, and uh, wood factories, carpentry factories, and so forth, they're, they're farmers' sons who didn't have the opportunity at home, but the, the resilience, and they had to get up and go to make something happen. And <clears throat> it is important that we in Northern Ireland as a community, have they get up and go whenever all of this is over to make a difference and to make this a better place than it was before? And we've referred to the local shops, how we need to support our local shops. I think that this community has pulled together in a remarkable way, having been a divided community for so many years. And I would love to see this community pulling together even more in a way which would have been unimaginable years ago where we, we don't get caught up with, with, with where somebody goes to on a Sunday or, or doesn't go on a Sunday or, or what sport to support or anything else. We'll work together to make things happen for your neighbours, whoever those neighbours happen to be. Folks, uh, the Minister has been on his feet now since 1622 hours, and it's now 25 past five. I think that just demonstrates there's been a bit of backsliding in terms of keeping it short and pointed, and there's still three members on my list, and it's my intention that those three members will get called and will get asking their questions. But I think it just demonstrates we do need to, in these sessions, keep it focused. I call Miss Claire Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I too, Minister, would like to express my condolences on the very sad death of your father. It's a hard thing to experience in good times. Um, and I can't imagine what it's like in the current situation, so um, I'd just like to say that. But having read the end of your statement, Mr Minister, there's no not convincing me that I think that you want to join the Green Party. 
That's the heart of green thinking, and I was really, really pleased to, to hear it because the language is really, really good in it. But I would like to ask you, can we take that as a green light that when we are talking about reimagining the economy post-COVID, we're going to have at the heart of that tackling the climate crisis? Are we talking about um, installing and implementing a Green New Deal and a just transition? I, I think there's so many things which we can do to help the climate and have done already and will continue to do. Uh, I think Northern Ireland has probably been away ahead of the game but hasn't got uh, properly recognised. So in terms of renewable energy, we're ahead of the game. In terms of recycling, we're up there. So we are. We, we have exceeded our targets. In terms of how we, we produce our, our food, I have always maintained um, that as a grass-based um, uh, agricultural system, that we are much more environmentally friendly than, than many of the practices across particularly Central Europe, where animals are kept indoors in feedlots. So I think that we are doing a lot, but we can do more, and we continue to do more. And I don't, I don't care much for, for, for these grand names of things. I, I, I care for outcomes. And I believe that it has been demonstrated over the course of the COVID that a lot of the things that we have, doing, have been doing have been delivering outcomes. And I think that it has been demonstrated to us that there is an advantage to Northern Ireland in terms of environmental practice in flying less and in driving less, and in terms of the energy production, ensuring that we, we maximise what we're getting from, from green resources. Uh, and in doing that, we can actually have more people living here. We can have a stronger economy because there is more people living here. And we can provide fantastic services through new digital means uh, without people having to travel uh, just as much as they did in the past. Ms. Billy, for a supplementary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. In your statement also, you refer to substantial schemes that have been put in place for um, the fishery sector and the farming sector, um, but yet we know that the horticulture sector, for example, is facing the brink of collapse currently. Um, so I'd maybe like to ask you why the disparity of response from within the department and what the date um, plans have been made to help um, the horticultural sector? The single biggest thing that we can do to help the horticultural sector is to allow them to sell their goods and allow people to go to their facilities to buy their goods. If, if we can socially distance in a supermarket or indeed a facility which sells alcohol, which I don't have an issue about people doing, and then surely we can do it in a large facility like a horticultural centre where there's probably never going to be more than 20 or 30 people at any one time. It is ridiculous and we look stupid by keeping, having people queuing outside the local wine store and we not allow people to go and buy a few plants, go out into their garden, involved in exercise, good for their mental health. And the biggest thing we can do to support that industry is to allow that industry to reopen once again. And I hope and I plead that the executive do that. Because I don't want to go to the executive. I've already raised the issue that we do need to financially support them. And they'll need some financial support either way. But we are going to have a very small bill or a very large bill if we want to sustain that horticultural sector going forward. And we can achieve a very small bill without impacting on the numbers of people who are contracting COVID-19. I wouldn't want to do it if I thought it was going to lead to an increase in COVID-19. I don't believe that it will. And I would appeal to my, uh, everybody in this chamber to support me in doing the right thing. I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, I join in the condolences to the Minister on the loss of his father. Charlie Pitts was a good man. Uh, could I also support the Minister in what he's just said uh, in the context of that and his public call for the sensible reopening of uh, garden centres and indeed for the facility of drive-in church services? I think all those are common sense, rational, safe. 
proposals. And in that context, he decided quite properly to open our forest parks. But I do want to press him on why, in association with that, he has kept the car parks closed. Take this storm of the state. It's not a forest park, but it's a place where people come for exercise. We all see that every day. And yet, as we drive out the gates tonight, we will see that there are cones at the car parking spaces. But the cars are just down the street, parked in front of people's houses. So where is the logic? Where is the sense of that? If we're going to open the forest parks, do we not also need to facilitate people to get to them and go to them, particularly as they're an asset for many urban dwellers, as well as those who live close by? So would the minister please relook at that issue of the car parks and the forest parks? I'm happy to, to do that, and I am looking at everything on a very. This is all fluid, so everything's moving, and, 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 and I'm happy to do that. Um, what the member requests. However, uh, the week before it closed down, um, it was a particularly sunny weekend, and we had masses of people who descended to Tullymore Park, Castle Welland Park, Murlock Bay up on the north coast, all of those facilities were overloaded with people. And therefore, it, is, it was important, certainly at the outset, that people got a message that if you continue to do this, folks, you're going to cost lives, and you're going to cost a large number of lives. Now, we've done that, and we got the message out there. And I believe the public have embraced the message. And we need to show a little respect to the public in terms of their ability to actually uh, behave responsibly because most people are in that page. So I think as an initial step, open it for the pedestrians so that they will be used largely by people from local communities and discouraging people from driving mm -hmm. distances to, to go to these facilities is the right thing to do. I, I, I get it that some people will park down the street and then walk around it. Um, it is largely to discourage large numbers of people um, descending upon these facilities, but we will look at how we can address that issue and as to how we can perhaps um, ha have people to ensure that only so many cars can enter some of the car parks, perhaps in some of our facilities like Tullymore, which are hugely popular because they're such beautiful places. Mr Alistair. Would the Minister give us an update on farm inspections? He had indicated in an answer to me that that issue was going to be reviewed by today. So what is the current position in respect of farm inspections going forward? Farm inspections were, were stopped uh, up until the, the 30th of April. Um, obviously, COVID-19 hasn't went away. It's, it's, we believe, and certainly the evidence that we're, we're receiving from the chief medical officer, is that there's less hospital admissions, there's a lower number of people going into intensive care, and that will ultimately lead to a lower number of people dying. Um, so hopefully we will see the downward trajectory on these figures. Um, so I believe that now is not the appropriate time um, to resume that activity, um, but it is something that we will consider um, over the course of, of, of later in the month of May. Call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Uh, thanks, Chair. I want to join with others to give my condolences to the Minister on the, on the passing of his father. Uh, the Minister um, has indicated that there could be 10,000 job losses in the agri food sector. The UN have warned the possibility of, quote, biblical famines. I have raised with him before the, the, the need to have uh, greater involvement from the state, and in particular his department, to uh, be involved in food planning and production. Has there been any further work um, uh, taken in regards to that? Minister? Um, generally, whatever the state puts their hand to tends to make things worse. So, I remember very well when I was at school studying um, how they brought in collective farms, for example, in, in, in Russia, and uh, their grain harvests were absolutely appalling. Um, uh, people tend to, to be much more productive when they're doing it for themselves than they're doing it for the state. Um, I believe that Northern Ireland can play its contribution and ensuring that people across the world are fed. And, you know, the great um, continent of Africa is, is buying large quantities of dried milk from Northern Ireland. Good quality, safe 
nutritious food uh, coming from, 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 from this place. Lots of food from Northern Ireland uh, ends up in the Far East and, and, and other parts of the world. So I believe that we can continue um, to drive productivity uh, by encouraging people uh, to have that independent streak. And, and believe me, we are very independent-minded people uh, here in Northern Ireland. And I believe that the best way forward is to encourage that independence to continue. Mr. Carroll. I would say to the Minister, in regards to the role of the state, um, I think the state has an important role, obviously, in health, as people would see now with NHS workers, but it has got an important role in terms of food production and planning, especially with shortages uh, or a possibility. Uh, and and they would be aware, I am sure, people are being forced to skip meals and food insecurities on the rise as a result of COVID-19. Um, and obviously, um, wrongly, in my view, food shortages have been uh, prescri prescribed to being as a result of panic buying, but it is actually down to uh, a more market-driven approach to food production. Uh, he correctly and, uh, he said in a statement we need to reimagine the future, something that I would absolutely agree with. Does he believe that we need to reimagine how food is produced and received in, in our society? Um, I just say to the member that in terms of our, our food production methods, um, we always need to be reviewing and advancing and ensuring um, that we do things better. And, and I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, and I believe that the people who produce food are happy with that because that is, they have been evolving and changing uh, as time has went forward, and uh, I believe that we can continue to do that. And the one thing that I do think that we can have some greater intervention in um, is the distribution of, of wealth within the agri-food sector. Um, I believe that the retailers are too powerful, and the farmers and the producers are too divided and, and, and weak to challenge that. And that is where government do need to provide some support, because I totally agree with fair trade policy, which ensures that a coffee farmer um, in West Africa um, gets uh, something which is of value to them and allows them to grow their farm and to feed their family. And I think that the same should be applied uh, here, where people are being productive, where they're working hard, they should get some return for it, and that all of the profits should not end up. Um, in one end of it uh, and not the other. And I do think that the Competition Commission um, has not provided that support to the, the primary producer um, that, that, that it should. Just in closing, can I thank everybody who has expressed their commiserations uh, on my father's death? And I want to say a really big thank you to the Ulster Hospital for all that it done. Thank you, Minister. The Minister started at 22 minutes past four. And it's now 22 6, so he went over, but I'm grateful that he stayed and answered all the questions. Agenda item four is the time, date, and place of our next committee meeting. We've received confirmation from the Justice Minister and the Minister for the Economy that each wishes to make a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee at a meeting next Thursday. Unless otherwise notified about an earlier meeting, this is when the next meeting of this committee will take place. Written notification confirming this will be issued in due course to members in the usual way. And as we exit the chamber, could I remind everyone of the regulations on social distancing? This concludes this meeting of the ad hoc committee. Stay safe. God bless. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary.